The hearing of the Youth Services Budget Committee hearing is called to order. Good afternoon, everyone. It's very good. I like audience participation. Um, good afternoon and welcome to fiscal 2019 preliminary budget oversight hearing for the Department of Youth and Community Development. I am Council Member Debbie Rose, the chair of the community of the committee on youth services. And I am pleased to be joined by my fellow council members, council member Eugene, council member Chin, and council member Williams. And we will hear today from DYCD Commissioner Bill Chong, Deputy Commissioner Alan Chin, and Associate Commissioner Jardine Fanor, along with the agency's team of program-specific deputy and assistant commissioners. Thank you all for joining us. First and foremost, we are here to discuss DYCD's $689.4 million budget for fiscal 2019. The preliminary budget includes only one new need for DYCD, supporting programming for runaway and homeless youth under the city's new NYC Unity Initiative. What is just as interesting as frequently seen to be the case for DYCD is what the preliminary budget does not include. Namely, as the new chair of this committee, I am concerned by the administration's decision to discontinue support for middle school summer programming under Schools Out NYC, or SONIC, leaving 22,800 children without services this summer. There are varying numbers um, of what number of students will be affected. And when this administration began its first term, we heard about the importance of protecting 12 to 14 year olds from negative influences outside of their homes and schools. It seems disingenuous now for us as a city to turn around and to suggest that this is no longer a priority. As a legislative body representing 8.5 million of our fellow New Yorkers, it is our responsibility as the council to ensure that the city's budget is as fair, transparent, and accountable as it can possibly be. This is why this year, beyond simply discussing funding levels, the council is also taking a deeper dive into the structure of each agency's budget. For DYCD, this means we will have a conversation about the limited number of units of appropriation used to organize funding for 10 different program areas. This committee will also review DYCD's performance so far this year, as reported in the Fiscal 2018 Preliminary Majors Ma Mayor's Management Report, or PMMR. Here too, I believe we will have just as interesting a conversation about what is not included in the PMMMR as about what is. DYCD oversees services provided to more than 150,000 New Yorkers each year. And while the preliminary mayor's management report captures many of these programs, it fails to discuss many others, like Cornerstone, for instance, never enter the conversation in the report, nor do whole subsections of the department's largest program, COMPASS, enter into this uh, report. The preliminary mayor's management report also does a poor job of contextualizing the data it provides. When we look particularly at programming and services for some of New York's most vulnerable residents, like DYCD's runaway and homeless youth population, or RHY, we want to have the clearest sense possible of where city services are making strides and where we have more work to do. DYCD has been tasked with managing the preparation for the city's next generation of leaders to fulfill their potential, and programs like the Comprehensive After School System, COMPASS, and the Summer Youth Employment Program, SYEP, are intended to help young New Yorkers rise to the next level. I myself am a, am a product of SYEP, and my experiences from that very first job 
have helped me help to make me who I am today. I hope that's okay with you, who I am, okay. <laughs> At the committee, we want to ensure that these programs are serving as many young people as possible, as well as possibly look forward to the, to, and I look forward to a productive conversation. But before we begin, I would like to thank my legislative and budget director, Edwina Martin, my legislative aide, Lisa Thompson, and my coordinator, Issa Rogers. I would also like to thank our committee staff, Paul Senegal, who is the counsel to the committee, Jessica Ackerman, senior finance analyst to the committee, and Kevin Katowski, who is the policy analyst to this committee also, Commissioner Chong, Deputy Commissioner Shen, and Assist Associate Commissioner Fenor. And our counsel will now swear you in. Thank you. In accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. Would you raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Would you please state your names for the record? Um, Bill Chong, Commissioner. Jadeen Fenor, Associate Commissioner. Alan Chang, Deputy Commissioner. You may begin your testimony, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Rose and members of the Committee of Youth Services. I'm Bill Chong, Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined by Deputy Commissioner for Administration, Alan Chang, and Chief Financial Officer and Associate Commissioner, Jardine Fanor. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on DYCD's fiscal uh, year 2019 preliminary budget. Since coming in into office, Mayor de Blasio has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to youth, families, and communities. Through his efforts and the support of the City Council, DYCD's budget has more than doubled from $408.6 million to $836.3 million uh, this fiscal year. Virtually every DYCD program has been increased, has, has seen an increased investment under Mayor de Blasio, from Compass and Sonic after school programs Beacon and Cornerstone Community Centers, the Summer Youth Employment Program, and the Runaway and Homeless Youth Services. Quite simply, our growth has been unprecedented. DYCD's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget stands at 680940000 million. This budget continues to build on our progress serving young people and families while being fiscally responsible and cautious during these times of uncertainty. For example, the President's federal fiscal year 2019 budget proposal includes, includes the elimination of the community services block grant and a 40% reduction of, in Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funding. These cuts would be harmful to thousands of young people and families in the city. We continue to closely monitor the federal budget process. In 2017, the Summer Youth Employment Program set another record, serving nearly 70,000 young people. We thank the City Council for your strong support of SYP. By working closely together, we have nearly doubled the amount of young people served since the mayor took office. We also served a record number of Ladders for Leaders participants with 1,855 young people accessing professional internships in sectors such as real estate, finance, fashion, technology, and city government. With 80% of the SYP funding now baseline, DYCD and its providers have more time to plan for the program's implementation each year. We opened the SYP application period on February 5th. This is the second year in a row that we have released it early, and we have just extended the application deadline to March 30th. As part of the mayor's action plan for neighborhood safety, SYP will continue to offer jobs to young people residing in 15 NYCHA developments with some of the highest crime rates. In addition to our efforts, NYCHA and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Services are also conducting special outreach to these developments through job fairs and NYCHA digital vans to assist young people with the online application. This summer, we are launching a school-based SYEP model with 18 providers at 32 vocational and technical high schools across all five boroughs. This pilot program will provide participants with summer job experiences that complement their school year academic and after school activities and interests. 
While ser serving some of our city's most vulnerable youth, the administration has made extraordinary investments of over $20 million in services for runaway and homeless youth. Most of the increased funding supports the expansion of runaway and homeless youth residential beds, which will triple to 753 funded beds by fiscal year 2019. RHY's fiscal year 2019 plenary budget level is at $40 million, and mostly city tax levy funding. Since last month's hearing on the three runaway and homeless youth bills that passed last week, we are pleased to report that an additional 12 beds have opened. There are now 557 beds open and available to young people, and an additional 196 beds are in the pipeline, and we anticipate that 96 of those beds will be certified and opened by June 30th of this year. We are grateful uh, to our providers for their diligence in helping to expand capacity at such a rapid pace. We are on target to have all 753 beds open in fiscal 2019. We look forward to continued discussions with the Council on how best to serve runaway and homeless young people. When the Beacon program reached their 25th anniversary last year, we were very pleased to add resources to, such, to, to each Beacon. This represented the first increase since Mayor Jenkins launched the Beacons under his Safe City, Safe Streets initiative in 1991, just to give you some time frame. Beacon funding has increased again in the current fiscal year. Overall, Per, um, overall, per beacon funding, each, each beacon has risen from an average of 346,000 to 550,000. By fiscal 2020, each beacon will be over 600,000 once all the cost of living adjustments have, pay, have been phased in. We also add 11 new beacon programs, increasing the total number of beacons to 91 sites. The new sites expanded the reach of our comprehensive school based community centers to thousands of additional New Yorkers and underserved schools and communities. Together, these sites can serve over 109,000 youth and families annually. Cornerstone, Cornerstone Community Centers provide youth with safe plans to grow with engaging activities including recreation, STEM, academic enrichment, project-based learning, and social and emotional support. These community centers engage over 18,000 young people and families across uh, and, and families annually at 94 NYCHA developments across the city. For the second year in a row, several programs will be sponsoring spring into health fairs in early April. These fairs will include health and wellness activities and information and promote wellness and health care access. There will be a total of 35 fairs in all five boroughs during the week of April 10th to April 14th. In addition to Cornerstone, some beacon programs will also be health fair sites this year. DYCD's Compass and Sonic After School programs continue to be very popular and successful in meeting the needs of youth and families. They complement what is learned during the school day while also offering recreation, enrichment, and cultural activities to support and strengthen the overall development of young people. As of the end of January, nearly 120,000 young people were enrolled in these programs. With an investment of 13.4 million, including 7.3 million from the Council, we've been able to serve 1,400 participants in adult literacy programs. We also expanded technical assistance and professional training, which included individual coaching, digital literacy, curriculum development, and teacher training. As you have heard in my testimony today, despite budget uncertainties at the state and federal level, the FY19-29 preliminary budget continues to place DYC in a very strong position to fund quality programs that improve lives and create opportunities to advance Social, social, socio and economically. We look forward to continuing to work with the City Council to support New York's youth, families, and communities. Thank you again for the chance to testify today. We are ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and before I start with the questions, I just want to acknowledge the young people who came out today um, to participate in the rally and support to save some Sonic and the advocates I want to say thank you so much for being here. That's shout out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and so, um, fiscal budget um, 2019, the preliminary budget for DYCD sees very little change from the previous years. In fact, very minimal change. How does DYCD prioritize this request for new or increased funding? And 
were there any other new needs that DYCD proposed that have not been included in fiscal 2019 preliminary budget? Well, let me say that um, we're in a very strong position because, as you know, in previous years, under the previous administration, we face enormous cuts. So to have stability and to have uh, and, and all core programs is that the key that we've been focusing on because, as you know, um, the city is facing a great deal of uncertainty both at the federal and state level. Uh, some of our major federal programs uh, face uh, elimination potentially in the president's budget. So we wanted to be prudent, cautious, uh, and focus on quality. So that's been our main priority, to maintain the core programs that we have. So, Commissioner, um, I understand you wanted to be prudent and, um, and, and, and looking realistically at what the forecast might be, but if you don't request the monies, um, how can we fight to get the funding for you? Or were there any monies that you requested in the preliminary budget that were not reflected? Uh, that you requested that were not reflected in the preliminary budget? I think the main thing for us is to maintain stability of the program. So I'm, ha I'm happy with what we have. Um, you know, obviously, it's an ongoing budget process. Things will get added, I'm sure, during the year. Like the summary employment last year, the minimum wage um, adjustment was added in the executive budget. So there, there are things that we know will happen, like minimum wage increases. So that is my main concern, and that I'm sure uh, will happen in executive. I'll, I'll move on. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget only includes one new need for DYCD, which is support NYC Unity Project. Can you tell us more about how DYCD uh, or what role you'll play in the Unity Project and the extent to which that role will expand in the future? Well. It's a very discreet um, investment. Uh, I think it's less than a million, uh, is that correct? And it's really to fund a, tw a, tw a second 24-hour drop-in center in the city for homeless youth. Uh, we recognize that the, the lives of young people who are homeless are, are not nine to five, and we, to the extent we can extend hours of service. Uh, we, the first 24-hour uh, drop-in center was opened, in, I believe, in 2014. Uh, 14 or 15, uh, and then uh, clearly there's a recognition that the more opportunities we give young people to act services after traditional hours, uh, and in fact, I visited the one in Queens that became a 24-hour drop-in center with the First Lady, and their caseload, I think, tripled just simply by adding evening uh, hours and 20, the 24 hours of service. So it's been a meaningful, a relatively small but meaningful investment. So um, are we on target to meet the projected um, goals that we had set for um, RHY, for the New York City Unity Project? I think so. I mean, it's, it, I was surprised in, after, I think, a couple of months of them getting the money that their caseload had tripled in a very short period of time. So um, I think it, it shows that we understand the needs of young people who are homeless or potentially homeless, that the easier we make it to access services, uh, the more likely they will access those services. And since the adoption of the fiscal um, 2018 budget, the administration identified $8 million in spending to, in re-estimates of uh, DYCD. And of this, $3 million represents underspending in SYEP. Where does the other $5 million come from? And to what extent has DYCD discussed COLA and minimum wage increases for service contracts with OMB? Jadine will answer this. Thank you for your question. Um, I want to make a correction. It's not eight million. I believe it's five million. I think could, it's, I believe it's sorry. I believe it's five million that we had to meet. Are we talking about the efficiencies instead of, instead yeah. of three? It was five million and it was split between two um, initiatives. And so underspending is general agency underspending. It wasn't specifically due to summer youth employment. Um, would it be correct to say that it's actually eight million since adoption? 
it may be, I don't think it's a million and now years. I will get back to you on that, but in regards to the COLA, you also had a question about the COLA. Um, DYCD is doing extremely well with the COLA. Um, we report up to a young lady named Jailer at the mayor's office. Um, to date, I think we have gotten at least about 80% of our COLA. We've been getting responses and we've been moving swiftly to get them registered. Um, in terms of your headcount, in fiscal 2019, the preliminary budget reduced the total budgeted headcount for DYCD from its current level of 528 full-time positions to 519. How many positions in the current fiscal 2018 budget are actually filled? And can you provide this committee with a disaggregation of unfilled positions? by program area and job title. So first, let me start. We have <clears throat> 528 allotted budgeted headcount. To date on board, we have 492. That represents approximately 93% um, DYCD being 93% staffed up with probably about a 7% um, variance. And due to attrition and other things, it's a decent level for us to have. In terms of where those 36 vacancies are, they're scattered throughout the agency. So it's not one specific program area that's impacted adversely, but they're just scattered throughout the agency. We'll be happy to get back to you exactly where the vacancies are, but I don't have that at that time. Thank you. Um, and for fiscal year 2018, more than 40 million of the council City Council's discretionary contracts were managed through one of DYCD's program areas, labeled other youth programs. The preliminary budget proposes to reduce headcount for other youth programs from 51 to 45. How will this impact the rate at which council discretionary contracts will be processed? So let me respond. I think I didn't answer one of your previous questions and it will probably respond to that. I think you asked about the 528 going to 519. And during ADOPT, all of those slots are kind of restored back. It's primarily um, CEO funding. That's one-time funding. It's not baseline. And so several of those positions fall out. And then every year in ADOPT, they come back in. And the other differences are due to um, some offsets, some increase of RHY headcount, incremental headcount that we've received, in addition to um, grant funding. So we eventually get back to 528 in the out years. Okay, is that um, this, uh, and that's also for the council discretionary contracts that are being so I need a by you. little bit more insight as to where you're seeing that drop off. Yeah, I, I think it might be how it's described. And, and when you say other youth services, I think the assumption that it's discretionary, and it's not necessarily discretionary. It's it's the, this, this one year res restoration of is it the young adult internship? Pro which which program is it? It's yeah, it's the center for well, not the center for economic opportunity, but it's the office of economic opportunity. There the. Funding for that program, not discretionary, but for those programs, has been one year, year to year. So that money gets ba added back into the executive budget. It's not this headcount for discretionary. And if I may add, we're fully staffed for um, discretionary. I actually checked with one of my colleagues here, and we don't have any vacancies in the discretionary. So you're saying you are fully staffed for discretionary? Right, because yes. you're asking how it impacted right. the, yes, the council. But in last year's preliminary budget, um, there was a proposal, you know, of a similar reduction in headcount to the other youth programs that didn't happen. But the other youth Why? programs are not discretionary. I think it's a question of how it's labeled. It's mm -hmm. these, uh, these programs that the Center for o Economic Opportunity funds us year to year. That's the discrepancy that gets added back in the executive budget. So where is the headcount for the discretionary um, funding uh, indicated? Okay, so we don't get um, funding for the headcount, but if I may, we have four U of A's. Um, two of them are PS U of A's, and the way that those are constructed, you have an administrative one and you have one that's programmatic. 
and then the other two U of A's, one is devoted to youth, the other to community development. So I just think that it's the way that it's categorized in the, I think you guys are looking at um, budget functions and we'll be happy to clarify and, and go offline and meet to see where the discrepancy is happening. And so you can provide for us where the, our discretionary money and the headcount. Right. We definitely know right. the, defin you, the discretionary money right. is, but we've never gotten headcount right. associated with processing yeah. council. That's, that's an important point. The money that the council gives us is completely to go to groups. We've never, in the history of DYCD, as long as I've been with the organization for 15 years, have gotten money from the council for staff. We self-fund that, and there's no plan to reduce staffing there. Okay, in fiscal year 2018, um, the mayor's management report indicated that there was a drastic drop in program monitoring by DYCD in fiscal year 2017. This Is time last year, this committee raised questions about DYCD's the Bendex, right? capacity, oh. capacity for current staffing levels. What measures has DYCD taken to improve your oversight capacity? Give us a second. Okay. Sure. I, so I think uh, what you're looking at is the number of uh, actual site monitoring visits has not gone down. Uh, the, and is our echo here? Yeah, so she can explain it in greater detail. That, so the mayor's office of contract services is moving to a new system called PASSPORT. And don't ask me what it, the acronym stands for. Mm -hmm. But so while the actual evaluations have been done, the data system which captures this stuff hasn't been uploaded yet to, to, to reflect in the PPMR. Is that an accurate layperson description? So is, are you saying the preliminary mayor's management report um, misreported or didn't accurately Sorry. report? Dana can tell me, ACO for DYCD. I should so, swear you in. Sure. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes. Please state your name for the record. Dana can tell me, agency chief contracting officer for DYCD. So the mayor's management report reflects the actual Vendex performance evaluations that MOX handles. With the transition to Passport, which is their new um, automated system, we actually, we're monitoring our programs, but the information is not in Passport at this time. So we'd be happy to give you a hard copy a spreadsheet of it, mm -hmm. but because this new data system that MOX has hasn't been able to capture all the data, uh, we actually can give you uh, the actual number. There's been no drop. It's just that the data system that the Mayor's Office of Contract Services hasn't really been able to uh, collect the data is it in, a, in a way that, that the Mayor's Office operation can. Yeah. And also, just to add, um, that is the MOC system. In terms of what DYCD does, we do monitor our programs ongoing. We have our own internal monitoring system that we have for each of our program areas. Um, but the actual report that you're looking at, it just reflects the annual Vendex that's part of the procurement policy board rules. And how long will it, it take before Passport sort of sorts yeah, I mean, this it's out? On, and it's, yeah, there's ongoing discussions um, with the mayor's office and with DYCD. There are all agencies that are under um, this right now, but again, I really can't speak to where MOX is with the development of the performance evaluations. Um, OMB produces a separate document known as the budget function analysis to show the programmatic distribution of funding levels. While it appears that this is a useful tool, ultimately the council votes to pass the city's budget each year at the unit of appropriation level. DYCD has 10 program areas, but only four units of appropriation. How does the current budget model benefit DYCD? Um, so we've worked with Jess before we've, we've met and we hear you. And what we've done thus far is we've been working with OMB. Um, hopefully there's hopes that we can get it through, but we've worked with home OMB to try to make it more transparent. So as you know, it's the U of A level, then the budget code. The budget code level is what gives it the unique 
description of the programs, right? That's just how the charter works. And so what we mm -hmm. need to do is definitely um, change some of our naming conventions because we know that they are a bit outdated and we are working on that. And um, even today, we OMB and I spoke about this. So we're going to be updating some of the conventions, but I think it's very transparent mm -hmm. in the way that our programs, very distinctive budget mm -hmm. codes that lead to mm -hmm. programs and, and specific data that you would need. Okay. Um, it, it seems as if we're, we're talking like apples and oranges and you need to like update that system because what we're doing is we vote on units of appropriation and not on the codes. And so it's very difficult for us to determine what we're voting on for, and what we're getting. No, I So is there some, are, are you in the process of looking at um, units of appropriation versus codes to um, bring your budget into sync with, you know, what we're doing? So I want to be, we, it, from an operational perspective for the agency, and we definitely want to be transparent for the council, from an operational perspective, the budget codes are how we do business and how we do contracting. And the U of A level is a higher level that providers, it, it, what you're asking for would interrupt business with our providers <coughs> because they don't operate on a unit of appropriation level. They, they operate on a budget level. And it's the budget level that is able to let us know which providers belong to which, which specific program. So that higher level, I think I understand you 100%, but that higher level and, and creating more U of A's is not going to, or in my estimation, is just going to make our process a little bit more, and not just for DYCD, but for our providers a little bit more difficult. But um, you have now four units of appropriation. Why can't you correspond or correlate units of appropriation with program areas? Why is that? Take me through the process that makes that difficult to achieve. Oh, I think if you look under each unit of provision, there are budget codes, right? Is that, is that am I correct? Yes. Yeah, so this document, which I, I think is in, in the public doc, is this published? Um, they may get something similar, but not We can, we can, I think we could provide this to you. So under each unit of provision, there are budget codes. So it's almost like the, under the unit of provision, you can look at details under each one. So I think we get to the same place where we want to be, which is, under this unit appropriation, how much is spent for this expense, how much is spent for that expense. So I, I think it, it is, and it's, I mean, you know, because we are audited all the time, we have to account for every single dollar, and where there's federal money and there's state money, so we have a very detailed budget codes, which probably gives you more detail than you really want, but it's under each unit of appropriation. So I think you get to what you want by looking at the budget codes. We hear you and we will work with OMB and, and we will try yeah, to get to where it is that you want. So you do understand what we're saying, that we are expecting to see units of appropriation for um, the programs, for every program, because this is, we vote on units of appropriation. So what, what, how, when, how long would it take you to be able to, to meet that standard for us to vote on your budget? This is a larger discussion with OMB. So as, I, as Jeanine says, we'll bring it back to OMB. But in the interim, if you want any more details of spending, we'd be happy to provide it to you. Commissioner, I appreciate that. And I, I know that you will make that information available to, to the committee chair and to the committee. However, we're looking to standardize what the council is doing in terms of the budget. And we vote on units of appropriation. And so we are trying to bring everybody into sync with that, that system. And that's and a so citywide decision. The expectation right, is right. that you will be able to do that 
and so that we can um, we can move forward with your budget. We understand what you want, and you okay. know that's a as I said something we have to discuss with OMB on. But we understand what your needs are. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know my colleagues have questions, and um, but and okay. Um, I, I will get back to you because Council Member Eugene has to leave, and um, in deference to his time, I will I will continue. Council Member Eugene. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you also for your leadership on you know fighting for youth. And uh, Commissioner, thank you very much. Uh, for your presence, and I want to take the opportunity also to thank all the your staff. But I'm going to be very brief because I have to leave, unfortunately. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm very concerned about the summer program for youth. Very concerned about that. We have been through that, uh, you know, several times in the past years. And I have heard and we know that everybody is talking about the benefit of the summer program for young people, for youth, for children. We know that the parents, and I say that several times, the parents, they have to go to work. The children, they're on vacations, but not the parents. And uh, I think that uh, the children deserve a place to go to continue to learn and to have fun. We all know that. We have make, made progress in the past years. But for me, it is like we are moving backward. And I was expecting to see the number increase and to make more progress. Uh, why in the budget, in the preliminary budget, we don't see any funding for the summer slot for the children? Unfortunately, because of the risk that the city faced, and particularly DYCD, given the proposed cuts in the federal funding to our agency, it's something we can't afford at this point. Uh, this, is, uh, this is your answer, but uh, let's let put it this way. Who, who set the priorities for DYCD? Obviously, I recommend priorities, but we're part of a larger budget discussion and the city has to make some difficult choices given the uncertainty both with the state and the federal budget. But when we talk about priorities, we see it all the time that the children, they are our future. And we know also during the summer, there are so many distractions and negativities. Well, let me say, first of all, we still plan to serve 77,000 young people through our community centers and our, our elementary programs this summer, on top of the 70,000 in the summer youth employment program. So it's not like there is no investment in summer programming by DYCD. It's the question of whether we can afford at this, uh, uh, given the cer uncertainties, the money you're talking about. Yeah, but I know, as I said, that we made progress. And I commend all of you, all of the members of the team who came together in the past years to make progress. And as a matter of fact, I got to applaud the mayor and all of you. We reached 70,000 summer job for the young people. That was remarkable, wonderful. I know they are great program and you, we have made a lot of effort, but I'm talking about the 34,000 children who will be there in the summer without do, doing nothing. That's what I'm talking about. And I think how much money would be uh, needed to protect those 34,000 slots? Well, I think it's 22,000. I think it's 22,000. I believe it's 30, 15 million. That's a drop in the bucket. This is nothing. I think that, you know, we in the city of New York, the city, the administration, the city council, we can work together to bring the money back to preserve those 34,000 slots, because those children are so important for us. And let me conclude by saying that, because I got to go, and I know my colleagues have questions also. 
at the end of your testimony, you say that the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget continues to place DYCD in a very strong position to fund quality programs that improve lives and create opportunities to advance socio socioeconomically. And you say that we look forward to continuing to work with the city council to support New York City's youth, families, and communities. We also in the city council, we member of this community, we would like to work together with you to achieve this very important goal. My question to you now, you are willing to work with us and we are willing to work with you. What can we do together to preserve, to protect those 34,000 slots? I mean, and I, I believe that if we work together, we can do it. The money that you just mentioned, this is nothing. Well, this is, as I said, the, the preliminary budget, the budget process goes all the way through June 30th. Obviously, you guys will continue to negotiate with the mayor's office, and we look forward to whatever support you can provide us. But can you support us also? Because you're talking about I mean, I, you know, walking together. I would together. always welcome additional funding that's added to my budget. Um, so we continue to appreciate the support that the council has, has made for DYCD and the programs that we um, sponsor. And you know that, and we say that several times, we want to work with you. We want to support DYCD. We do want that. But I think that you have a certain uh, authority to set the priorities. But I, w I would expect that in your uh, process to set the priorities, that, you know, the summer program for the young people, for the children, I mean, summer camp, I mean, would be part of your priorities. I mean, we, as I said earlier, my focus is to make sure that the core programs that, that DYC operates are funded. And, you know, just to give some perspective, it was only five years ago, only, and I remember that something like 40% of our budget was uh, added at the last minute. We had half our homeless youth programs, depending on last minute money, half our summer job programs, depending on last minute money, half our after school programs. So I think uh, knowing how bad things were five years ago and where we are today, that the oral core programs have money to operate on July 1st. Anyway, I'm going to uh, stop here, but I want to say that I was happy to see the children on the step of City Hall you know, one hour before. They were there crying, begging for some program for themselves. They were begging, yelling, and you know, trying to get something positive for the summer. That was remarkable, and we should make sure that we do everything possible to protect those, uh, or preserve those 34,000 slots. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for your testimony. And Madam Chair, thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Eugene. Thank you for your concern and for uh, all the work that you did uh, previously for the Youth Services Committee. Um, Commissioner, I just want to, um, not to belabor the point, but I just want to say that 90% of you know, the program budget of the code is in one unit of appropriation. And then you have, in the community development-related programming, it has its own unit of appropriation for contract spending. This is not transparency. It, it, it's not transparent. Okay. And, um, and I, I was glad to hear you say that you would go back to OMB to discuss this so that we can get on the same page. So I, I appreciate your efforts on in that behalf. And in, in previous years, funding for a summer sonnet has not been restored until after the release of the executive budget. However, part of the ability to restore funding has been contingent on program providers having already enrolled participants and secured staff for the summer. How feasible would it be for providers to even get summer sonic programs off the ground for fiscal 2019 if funds were restored in April or May, or even in June? So right now, we have no plans to 
expand the funding beyond what we have, but as we've shown in the past, uh, in the last few years, but in previous years, even in the previous administration, that the staff at DYCD are very hardworking, very uh, nimble, and then the nonprofit partners are also very committed to getting services up and running as quickly as funding becomes available. So I'm confident if we, we get to that point, but right now we're not there, uh, we can move quickly. I mean, I, refer, I reference the experience from five years ago. For multiple years, 40% of the city's, of DYCD's budget was not finalized until the adopted budget, yet programs still happened. So I, I think, you know, we're committed, if funding becomes available, to making sure it gets into the community. But aren't you setting them up to fail when you do not give them enough time to, um, to organize, to do, to put systems in place that they need to? Enrollment needs to start now. Parents need to, need to know now. Um, when you, you're setting them up for failure, and then they're not going to be able to enroll the numbers that we would like to see them enroll. And so it starts a ripple effect where now they don't need that level of funding because they're not meeting the enrollment criteria. It's setting up a cycle of, of failure for these groups that have to have lead time to do this. And so I, I need to know that you have been fighting to make sure that it is in the budget this go round and not waiting until adoption. It, it is not feasible for these providers to provide services, needed services that I don't think anybody disagrees with. I'm sure, and I would hate to think that the administration doesn't see the, the necessity and and how important this program is. But to be a party to setting them up for failure and not being able to deliver the services, even if the administration has a come to Jesus moment and decides to fund this, this needs to be decided at this juncture. I wanna know what, what measures you're taking to ensure that this is going to be a discussion because I didn't see anywhere where there was a request for any type of funding for summer sonic respectfully from your agency. Respectfully, I disagree with your characteriz mm -hmm. characterization of setting up the failure because the proof is in the pudding that when funding comes in at the last minute, we have gotten it done, our partners will get it done, our staff will get it done. For, as you know, for many Your years. Your staff gets it done, but the providers are not well, able to deliver the services, the, and they're not able to get the necessary well, enrollment that they need to have. We've managed to get young to people meet enrolled. The need. So, can I respond? Sure. Okay. Respectfully, young people have been enrolled. Give the best example is the summer youth employment program. There were years not too long ago where we would get half the funding two weeks before the start of summer, and the program happened. So I'm confident that the same thing can happen if money comes in very late. And I think it's something I wanted to share with the other committee members that the way the summer SONIC program operates, it's not an eight-week program. It's 108 hours over four weeks. So what's happened in the past, if money comes in late, uh, programs start later and they can run into August. So I am confident that given if the funding becomes available, given the commitment of the staff, of the CBOs, and of DYCD, services will be delivered. I, I understand that, and I, and I appreciate that, you know, there's that latitude. However, parents need to know now. They're making plans for the summer now. They cannot wait until then, and then for the provider to say, well, we're, we're going to provide services in August as opposed to July. They need to know now, and that's, you know, that's the point. Ideally, okay. I agree with you, more time is better, but I, I think to say we're setting people up for failure is probably uh, over-exaggeration. I think we can get it done. Um, Council Member Jamani Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. So I, I do have to say, the most frustrating line for me was, I'm happy with what I have. 
Um, in the eight years, nine going on nine years, you're probably the only commissioner I've ever heard say, and it seems to be some sort of language like that that's used every single year. And so for the life of me, I cannot understand how a commissioner would come before the city council year after year and not ask for additional funding. Uh, on top of that, every year you give a synopsis of what's happening. And so you talked about the great work that's been done, the budget's been increased, the summer youth jobs, the Sonic, and then you say you're happy with what you have. You said something similar last year. How could you be happy with what you have both years or at least three years running? And they've increased only because we forced it to increase. So can you reconcile you coming here every year, not asking for additional funding, saying you're okay with what you have, but then the next year when we force it down DY City's throat, you then say you're happy with what you have. I'd say that the largest increase in our budget were two things that the administration recommended and implemented. One was the Sonic expansion, which uh, more than, uh, I think our after school program now is what, 200, 400 million? How much? Yeah, so the biggest increase was actually not by the council, but by the administration. And the second biggest increase was, well, not second, but one of the other largest increases was the Beacon program. So I, I kind of disagree with that the increases were the let, let me rephrase oh, the no, it's a, no, no, I'll rephrase it. How can you not ask for any money last year, get additional money, even if it was from the administration, I'll look at the numbers, and then come back and say you're happy with what you have. You can't be happy with what you have one year, not ask for additional money, then get additional money, be happy again, we're, we're then focused. get additional money and be happy again. But it belays the facts that the growth has been in the budget has been initiated by the administration, after school, homeless youth, the Beacon program, those were all initiated by the administration. So I'm very happy with those changes. I well, went through. I will have to push back because even if you say the administration, which I'm giving for this argument, we have had to push the administration on many of, on, on many of these. There's been a dialogue. But we have had to push but, but the administration. The, but the biggest increase. But, I, but I, my question is still this. It's not the commissioner asking for these things. And I just don't understand that. The, bi the biggest increase in our budget was after school. Did you push it? The that, mayor pushed it. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, but, but I'm saying that's the administration. I work for this administration. We work hand in hand with the All of the commissioners work for the administration. Right. You are the only one that doesn't ask for anything. And I just asked you if you pushed for it, you said the mayor pushed for it. I just, I, is it, is it, isn't it part of your job to ask the, for additional? So I'll give you an example. The Beacon expansion was something I asked for. It, I got it. So, you know, it's when, okay. when the budget doubles in four years, it's hard to say that uh, there's been no action by this administration. I didn't say, I'm talking about the commissioner, well, DYCD. But who every year comes a lot of this is back and forth and doesn't with the mayor's ask office for and OMB. Funds and, and, and so says, it's for you. Your go, quote, I'm, I'm repeating what okay. you said. You said, I'm happy but, with but, what I have. So yes, what I, would, I am. What I would probably figure is going to happen is there'll be additional funding that will go into the programs we care about. And then next year, you will say the same thing. That's a frustrating thing. Just the dialogue should be between, between us, the commissioner, have a conversation and figure out what it is. But there seems to be no part where the commissioner is saying what is needed for the agency and for the young people what? in the city of New York. I think the dialogue should be between the council and the mayor's office of budget because they have to look at the larger picture, uh, challenges facing the city. Dude, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say to that. I, I, wow. <laughs> like, I'm astonished by what you're saying right now on the record. So what is the role of the commissioner? I think it's to really identify needs. We pass them on to the budget's office, and then in the back and forth, as they begin to plan what, what the city can afford, and then we're going to execute the programs that are funded. So your primary job is execution? Well, I work with the Office of Management and Budget. I gave you the example of the Beacon expansion. That's something that we initiated. Right. And you know, they, they were able to fund it. At some point, my hope is that the administration will prep you better for these answers because 
these are wild answers you're giving for a commissioner of an agency of such importance. I just, I gotta say that. I didn't expect this to be the result of the questioning, but. I think the results speak for themselves. <laughs> the fact that the budget yes, is double. I pat the council on the back uh, for that. So um, let me try to focus on what I wanted to focus on, um, which was summer youth employment. Um, whew, so I'm sorry. I, I, you, I was really thrown off unexpectedly. Um, so I, I support all of these programs. Of course, the, the, the camp uh, jobs that folks are trying to get back. But something that's been very uh, dear to me is a summer youth program um, that we've gone from FY14 to from about 36,000. We're now up to about 70,000. Um, there has been general agreement that we, if we can get to universal uh, in youth employment, we'd like to. So I'm trying to see what the DY City has done in preparation to try to get there. The, it's been baseline now, 70,000. General agreement between advocates whom I thank very much, uh, particularly CSS and I see Andy Bowman here, uh, who did a lot of work on this as well and others, um, that 100,000 100, jobs would, for all intents and purposes, be universal. I know the council, many members of the council, I know the chair and others, uh, do still view this as one of the priorities. What has, the, what has the department done to try to prepare to get to that? So at this point, we're, in, um, we're piloting um, some of the recommendations from the council um, uh, mayoral uh, work group of a year ago. And uh, so this year, we're adding 5,000 uh, jobs set aside for school-based programs. Um, and so, we're not there at 100,000 yet. Um, I'm sure that will come up in the negotiations between the administration and the council. Uh, if we get there, we're prepared to scale up. Uh, we're gonna issue a request for proposal this fall, which will hopefully bring on new providers. Um, the original network of 100 and some odd programs isn't enough to really meet the demand of new jobs. So uh, we're ready. Um, it's a process that I'm sure will be playing out over the next few months. Yeah, um, I did want to just clarify. You said adding on 5,000. So is it, are you adding on to 75,000 or is it included in the 70? It's included in the 70. Okay. So are we planning to add any additional? I think that's something I'm sure will come up in the budget negotiations and we're prepared to scale up if additional money becomes available. Um, so because the question that you that's always brought up is capacity. So what's being done to make sure the capacity is there? So the plan is to ex um, issue a request for a proposal this fall, which we hope to add more programs, as well as, uh, as you may have seen in the concept paper we issued last year, different strategies to better serve young people, because we know that one size does not fit all, that young so, people, so, so. The, that's in the, the fall. In the fall. But we have to put the money in now for the budget. We can scale up uh, based on whatever money becomes available. So you, uh, so if we, so the, the, the number to get to 100,000 100, is $63.8 million. That will get us to full 100,000 on top of the 120. If we get there, we'll make it work. So just for clarity, if you got an additional 30,000 jobs at $63.8 million, you can make it work before the RFP comes out? will make it work. I mean, a few years ago, we had 20,000 jobs in the last two weeks, and the nonprofit community stepped up. So whatever the amount of money becomes available, we will work with our nonprofit partners to make it happen. So one of the reasons I stopped pushing uh, last year, and I do think also uh, the then speaker, Mr. Mark Brito, and finance chair, Jalissa Ferreras Copeland, is that the advocates actually did say they would be, have trouble filling additional slots. And that mirrored something that the administration sometimes would say capacity. Right. But it sounds like you're saying now. Well, without a number, it's hard for me to say. But whatever the number is, we'll figure out a way to get it done. I'm, because I'm giving a number. I'm saying okay. if we get a. I have to, you know, look at it and see whether you know what can be done with additional money. But as I said, the track record has been when count money gets added, we can get it done. We have a long-term plan, which is the request for proposal, which will be coming out this fall, which will increase our capacity much more in the long term. So from last budget negotiation to this, what has the department done to increase 
capacity to get to 100,000? We can't add new programs without an RFP, so we just add additional jobs to each program. So nothing, basically, is what's happened from Well, that, but that's been the case for seven years, or f six years. Okay, it sounds well. like. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. State your name for the record, please. Andre White, Associate Commissioner, Youth Workforce Development Programs. So yes, Jamani, we, we do recognize that there's been a capacity issue, right? Um, as a part of the task force, which we were all a part of that convening last year, we implemented a number of changes to make sure that provider have the resources necessary to scale up if we do get late, fu late funding. One of the things that we have done, we've released the worksite application earlier. So typically that application would have gone out in March, it's now being released in January. What does that simply mean? It means that providers have adequate time to develop as many jobs as possible. The second thing that we have done, we have also released the participant application earlier, right? So the application was, re was released on February 5th. Um, the deadline is going to be March 30th. What does that mean? Providers have more time to run lotteries, to do assessment, and everything is spread across three months, opposed to being done in two months. So with time, providers are able to do more. So we move the timeline a lot to make sure that providers are able to do what they need to do on the ground. Thank you. Um, would the would the department and advocates be able to handle if we magically got the thirty thousand additional job slots? Capacity is definitely an issue. I I, I won't say it's not. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, the providers are always committed to making sure that we provide meaningful summer job experiences to young people. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, it depends on what that number is. Um, myself, I was the SYP director for many years, um, so I know exactly what it takes for an equality program, and I see that providers are a little bit stretched, but that doesn't mean that with additional TA and support that they can increase the number of jobs. Okay, uh, so I think the plan we were trying to do is see if we can gradually step up and get to the 100,000. The sooner the better. My hope is that it will become a, a, a priority again um, during the budget negotiations. So my hope is that happens, um, even if it's increased I mean, hopefully we can get to 100,000, even if it's uh, more. The commitment, sometimes we make commitments, a multi-year commitment, and we drop it. And uh, as I've mentioned before, when it comes to violence, the number one thing that cuts violent crimes in half is a job. And so I think it's very important that we continue to push this. I think all of these programs are a part uh, of the partnership with the NYPD and, and others that have helped get us to where we are. And I want to make sure that it continues to grow. Uh, so uh, I, have one, I have one last question. Um, can a young person's income from SYP count against their family's eligibility for benefits, like SNAP? This is a very complicated issue, right? Um, and we've been working with um, HRA and the mayor's office to um, talk to folks on the state level to actually change the legislation. It can have an impact. Um, however, what we do recommend to young people and what DYCD has done over the years, once a young person is notified that their benefits have been impacted, uh, my staff and myself, we present a letter to the young person so they could take it to HRA, so they could show that they were part of a summer job program and not an extension of like a larger long-term program, which means that they'll be getting more money, right? So it's really for our exploration, so yeah. It can, but we, we try our very best to make sure from our end that we provide the letter that they could take to HRA to make sure that they're aware of what programs they were a part of. So uh, the brilliant minds over here have found out that uh, Alaska and some other states have been designed so it doesn't penalize um, young people. So hopefully you can reach out to some of those states. It does sound like you're reaching, you're talking to the state now. We are talking um, to the state now, currently, uh, yes. Uh, my understanding is that at least on the staff level, uh, those conversations go a little bit smoother. Uh, so my hope is that it will go smoothly here. Uh, thank you for answering my questions. Commissioner, I don't expect you to know the minutia of every program. I'm glad the Deputy Commissioner uh, was here to answer my questions. I do expect a lot more, I don't know if vision is the right word, a lot more push, a lot more ask from a Commissioner. I'm astonished that you feel that you don't need to be in these conversations. It needs to be just the Council and the Mayor. My hope is you would rethink 
what your role is as a commissioner of DYCD, there are a lot of young people who are counting on the decisions that we're all making here. So thank you for that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member Williams. Um, and now we'll have uh, questions from Council Member Chin. Thank you, Madam Chair, yep. um, Commissioner. You know, I've been on this committee since I started in the City Council. So this is my ninth year, right? And I remember the first four years, it was tough. I mean, under the prior administration, it was about cut, 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 and all we can do is fight to restore um, what was taken away. And there was never any opportunity to even talk about new program, expansion. So I, you know, I see the, the improvement um, in this last four years. We were excited about all the new program that got more money and you know the beacon program of course you know syep unprecedented number of summer youth jobs um and then the universal middle school after school program i mean it's a signature piece from the mayor and that is why i just can't understand why that the summer component of the sonic program of the universal middle school after school program do not have a summer component funded. It doesn't make any sense to me. It needs to be a year round program, including the summer. When I was a summer school um, after school teacher, when I graduated from college many, many years ago, you're hired to work all year round because the summer component is part of the program. So, and when our mayor talk about income inequality, He's not helping the low-income family, okay? Because the summer component is not there, and every year the parents worry middle school kids are the most vulnerable. I mean, like, you don't want them hanging out in the street, and we all know that. And we all know the benefit of the program. The after-school program has been so successful, but we don't want them to be left alone in the, in the summer. But for a lot of parents, that are low income, they have to work, they don't have the money to send their kids to camp or to specialized program. But yeah, I mean, some other parents, middle income parents, they have the option. But for a lot of low income parents, immigrant parents, they don't have the option. And then today at a rally, one of the providers was telling us a survey that they did with the kids. And a lot of kids, you know, they're gonna end up staying home, or they don't know what to do. And that's not what we want for them. So I hope that you will work with us to make sure the mayor gets it. I just don't understand why he doesn't see the summer component as a core program as part of the middle, middle school after school program that he has been so good on. All right? So we're gonna work very hard to make sure it's included, but when you when you answer um, Council Member Williams' question earlier about your priority is making sure core programs are funded, are running, great. That summer component should be in the core program. Because I don't want to waste time fighting for that. Because I want to get something else. So the, the Compass program, I want to get to universal after-school program for every single kid in our public school, all right? We're not there yet. And these are the elementary school kids. We don't want any more of the latchy kids. I mean, there are times where kids have no choice. They're home by themselves. For a lot of immigrant kids, you know the stories. We're not even there yet, right? We're pushing for universal summer job, and we're getting there. We're getting there. We got to work on Sonic. And the summer component of, uh, uh, of the uh, compass has got to be expanded and make sure it's all together. And we got to make sure that's also a universal program. And on top of that, <laughs> I mean, this is what we need DYCD to work with us in terms of new needs, in terms of what we should be striving for. Mayor is introducing universal pre-K. Hey, those pre-K kids also need after-school program and summer program. K-3, they also need that too. 
So those are the programs that we have to work towards. The mayors are starting wonderful program, universal after school for middle school kids, great. Left out the summer component, all right? So these are the new needs or projected needs that I think DYCD should work with us. You set up a task force, you know, with us on the summer youth job and we got great information that can help really improve that program. But these are the program that at DYCD should also be working on. The Beacon program is great. Cornerstone program is great. We need more support for that, right? Because having kids have a place to go at night, it, we know the result. We know it's a lot of good things are happening. And you're part of that, Commissioner. But we also got, we want to have more good program coming, uh, coming in the pipeline. So you got a lot of work and a lot of things to fight for. But that's why I think we want to hear from you is that part. You're, you're happy your budget has doubled. And we are very happy your budget has doubled. I remember the Bloomberg day when I used to tell the commissioner, you know, I think you should be the city council's commissioner because most of the funding was city council money, all right? So we have made a great stride, but we want to hear from you and your staff the vision of getting to, you know, universal compass program, universal after school program for every single kid in our school year round. That's what we want to hear from you. Uh, so I think the frustration from my colleagues, I mean, I know you want to make sure that the programs that you got funding for runs and there's a lot of great things that's been happening. But hey, man, ask for more. <laughs> Do more, you know what I mean? And that's what we hear, right? We have a, a Chair Rose and all of us, we're supportive. You know, we're willing to work with you. But we need to hear those visions. Um, so look, the summer program, it better be in the executive budget. The summer component, because I am telling the mayor, he should not mess with this, because otherwise we're going to take the universal middle school uh, credit back. We're not going to give him the credit for that. I mean, it, come on, it just it doesn't make sense to us. And you're looking at jobs, I maybe for the providers, the people, the director, the teacher. It's a year-round job. It's not a job just without the summer. They have to work in the summer. That's part of the job. So we got to make sure that, and you, you're taking this, and the mayor is just taking out this little part to do the budget dance. Hey, we don't do budget dance anymore. So why, why are you taking that little out? And you're saying that federal cuts, this is such a little part of money. It doesn't make sense, all right? We want more. Let's talk about uh, the regular kids in the elementary school. We want a summer program, an after school program for every single one of them because that will also help them improve uh, academically in the school. We're making, we're making progress, so we gotta do that. All right, Commissioner? So you gotta give us those uh I appreciate your enthusiasm, uh, Margaret. Um, we've known each other many, many years. Um, and so we appreciate the support. I mean, I just wanna make clear again for the record that we do have summer services happening there are 77,000 young people that will be served this summer in elementary or middle school through the community centers. We expanded hours at all the community centers to the evening. So it's not a situation where there are no services in the summer. We're talking I about did not say there was no service. I know. We know that. But still, one kid not getting a program is unacceptable. Okay, so we got to make sure that all the kids who are in the after school program, that they should be able to continue with their summer program. I hear, I hear you. The fact that it's not in the budget doesn't mean the program is, doesn't have value or merit. It's a question of what the city can afford at this juncture. An $88 billion budget and you're telling me we couldn't afford 20 million for the summer. It just should be baseline. It should be part of the after school program. That's it. I'm sick and tired of fighting for this every year. It's not right, it was in the proposal, right? When the mayor started the first year of the universal uh, after school, middle school program, the summer component was there, right? Actually, it wasn't. In the RFP and in the concept paper, it was a school-based program. In fact, the big difference 
in the Sonic program was that in the school year, instead of nine hours, it went to 15 hours. So the emphasis from the very beginning in the design of the Sonic program was to have a more robust school year model. But school year, but what are you gonna do with the kids when they're out of school? Everyone know that at that age, they're vulnerable you know, to get in trouble. Every expert, every provider can tell you that, right? So if you want to build on the success that they get during the school year, you can't leave them out in, during the summer. Look, I don't think we disagree on the merits of the services. It's a question of what the city can afford, and that's really the discussion, because the fact that we believe there is a need for summer services is why we've, we're serving 77,000 young people this summer. It's a question of what we can afford. I don't think is what is the question of what we can afford, okay? I think the question is really, if, if we truly believe that our kids are a priority, I mean, that should be part of the program. It just doesn't make sense to me that it's not a year-round program when it has proven you know, to be so successful. And so we need to work towards, okay. besides that, we also need to work towards for our elementary school kids, because I have students in my district who cannot, who, are, who don't have after-school program. And in order to get one, they can't get a one from the city, a free one, they have to pay. Mm -hmm. And for working families and low-income family, immigrant family, $20 a day is a lot of money. So, and we're still not even taking care of those kids. So I want to work towards universal after school program for every kid, especially you know in our elementary school too. So there, there's a lot more that we have to fight for. Um, Chair, right? We we're gonna we're gonna have to continue to do that. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Thank you. Um, I I don't know how else or what else anyone here and on this committee could say about the importance of it. But the administration saw that it was important, there was a critical need, and they baselined it one year. And then to take it back, you know, that means that there was value that they had, they saw that it was worth baselining, and then to take it back, not baseline it, and to then not even want to fund it is not, is not something that is even fathomable. And, and I know that you understand the value of this program. And what is difficult for the council members to understand is that there is not any push coming from you, from the department to say to the administration, this needs to be funded. And Council Member Chin is absolutely right. In this administration, we have touted the fact that we don't have to do the budget dance anymore. And here we are dancing. You know, we now have a, a commissioner for cabarets because <laughs> there is a place where people go to dance, and it's not supposed to be here at City Council for the budget. And it's, it's really, it's frightening that our agency head is not being more forceful with the administration in terms of the need for Summer Sonic and for this programming. We've made great great strives, we have diminished the, gradu um, the dropout rate, the graduation rates are up, crime rates are down, and to the now say to a very vulnerable population that we don't have enough money, there is money for whatever this administration thinks is important. And what we are saying today is we want you to take the message back that this has to be important because they have found money for new programs. And this is a tried and true program. And so we want you to take this message back that it has to be in the budget. We don't want to wait. We don't want to wait with the maybe. 
and the, the possibility, we want you to carry this message that this has to be a priority, and it should be a priority for DYCD. So, loud and clear, I think this has been uh, something we're aware of. Um, but I, I do want to say that, again, let's remember that this administration is probably the most committed to young people in history. I mean, I think we kind of get lost in the, in the trees and forget the forest here, that given the huge commitment this administration has made. Commissioner, and, oh. do you know that we've done a lot for NYPD? We, we increased their headcount, we got them bulletproof vests, we got them body cameras, and every year the commissioner still comes back and says, we need X, Y, and Z. That is not a palatable argument. It is not. You are supposed to be the voice for the youth in this city. We need you to say to the mayor, when he asks about what your budget priorities and concerns are, to say that these are the concerns and that, no, we don't want anything eliminated. That's your job. And we want you to do that. And we do do it. And the fact is our budget has doubled. I mean, I think it's a little disingenuous to simply say, that I'm not advocating for the agency when the budget has doubled, when most of the growth in the administration has been in after school, something the administration added, runaway homeless, something the administration added, beacons, something the administration added, where we work closely together with the summer youth employment program. So I think it's important that the facts do matter. Uh, I understand the passion that people have about this particular program, and you know I think the mayor hears it as well. And it's something I will pass on again. I'm sure he's aware of it. And we'll, we'll see where this process goes. And I want to commend you on the record that, yes, there has been growth in DYCD's budget. Yes, we have increased funding to youth programming. We acknowledge that. And no one is trying to downplay that. But you are now talking about apples and oranges. We acknowledge that, and we are thankful for your advocacy in that area. But what we're talking about now is a program that exists and was baselined at one point that we want that program funded, and we don't want that to, and we want it to be a priority for you. Um, Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Chair Rose. It has been said by all of our colleagues, and we stand united on this particular issue, we all believe that it is wrong to balance our city's budget on the most vulnerable, our middle school students, young people that can't vote, young people that don't have a voice at the same level as many of us. And the fact that they were here today, hundreds of them, to say that they want a summer experience and that they want to continue that program we can't, in good consciousness, as elected leaders, allow them to go unprotected and to be vulnerable during the summer months. All of the programs that we're touting are very holistic and organic in that each of their success depends on the other. And if we allow 34,000 young people to not have a summer experience, we don't know what's going to happen in the way of gang activity, set activity, teenage pregnancy, gun violence. These are all the issues that we've made so much progress in. I wanted to um, first start off by asking, through the SONIC program during the summer, are young people provided meals for breakfast as well as lunch? Uh, let me have Susan Haskell, our Deputy Commissioner, come talk about Because I think it's important to understand what we're right. unraveling here. Yeah, because we already served 77,000 young people through our after-school program, so she can talk a little bit more about what kind of activities those young people will be getting. I'm talking about through, I'm asking specifically about the Sonic program. She can talk about all of that, including Sonic. Um, I, I please, might have to get right back. Hand. Sorry. Would you please? Yes. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? 
and to respond honestly to council members' questions. Yes, I do. Please state your name for the record. Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner Youth Services. Uh, to your question about food, I know the city has makes great efforts in every spring leading up to the summertime to make sure that free meals are available to children in schools, and we certainly use our broad reach in the community to publicize those. Whether you're involved in one of DYCD funded programs or not, you can come to schools and get food. Our sonic programs, like the commissioner outlined, they're not, in the elementary programs, a young person is gonna get a meal. In a, in a sonic program, they, they're operated in very different ways. We give them flexibility, 108 hours over a minimum of four weeks. So depending on what model you're doing with the young people, you could stretch that out longer. You could do it in the four week period. They may or may not be with the provider during mealtime, depending on how they choose to spread it out. But we make sure to work in partnership with school food that young people know that they can get food at schools and other locations throughout the city. So you would be prepared for 34,000 young people that were traditionally in this program to go to alternative places for food? I'm, I, would, I would like to get back on the details of that, but I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to say yes based on each year the efforts that we go to to promote those meals with school food to young people. I'd, I'll have to check on what their actual capacity is, but I'm inclined based on those efforts to say absolutely. So young people would go to a school and be able to eat and then leave? Yes, and part we do at parks and recreations facilities and other public access points. I would like to get back to you on the details of that. Because I'm very concerned that we're talking about 34,000 uh, young people and their ability to have security, safety, food, all of these different elements. For us, I'm just... The way the commissioner is talking about it and the way that you're discussing is that if money should happen to be found, we can ramp up quick enough in order to be able to still provide the services. But we don't just want this to be a program that is okay. We want it to be an amazing program for the summer and amazing programs take an incredible amount of planning. We want this to be a memorable summer for our young people. We want them to be able to know consistently how they're gonna travel there, that they're gonna have a meal for breakfast and lunch. It takes time to plan uh, uh, trips and field trips and activities and all these different sorts of things. All of these things take an incredible and an enormous amount of time. And we are here every year to fight for this particular program. And this takes valuable time away from us to fight for our constituents who are having uh, mold issues, that have been having heat issues, that are having eviction issues, that are concerned about any, nor any number of issues in terms of transportation. Uh, there's so many issues that we have to address as elected officials. We shouldn't have to be addressing where our middle school students are going to be for the summer. This takes valuable time away from our offices, from our staff, from each of the elected officials, and it really prevents growth as a, as a community because we're fighting for basic services that we shouldn't have to debate about, discuss, and we all attended Mayor de Blasio's State of the City where we talked about this being the fairest city in New York. And we're not seeing that translate when it comes to our youth. There have been incredible amounts of strides made as it pertains to our youth, but to let 34,000 of them go without a structured program, and I don't mean a drop-in program, because a drop-in program is a drop-in program. You, you can't quite adequately prepare for a drop-in program the way you do for a structured program. And so this has to be addressed this month, and I think we're all baffled as to why this is not a passionate issue that everyone behind your table is not fighting for and saying, hands off, we draw the line in the sand here. This program absolutely cannot be cut. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cumbo. Um, Commissioner, we'd like to ask you some questions about uh, runaway and homeless youth. Um, we have a lot of people who want to um, testify, and I hope that um, you'll be able to stay to hear from, from our advocates and our public. But um, in terms of uh, our runaway and homeless youth, 
Um, the current budget supports 653 beds. Traditionally, the primary challenge has been getting beds online and um, a schedule to in finding providers with adequate capacity, finding suitable space, and getting space certified by the state's Office of Child and Family Services. What makes DYCD confident that you can make all of the current, currently scheduled beds, including those to be added in the coming fiscal year, available by the end of fiscal year 2019? Let me start, and then maybe Sue can, Susan can add as well. Um, I think in my testimony I said that we expect to add another 95 or 96 beds by the end of this fiscal year. That means these are uh, beds that have been funded and just waiting for the final sign-off either by the, the state or buildings or fire department. So we'll probably and what be number is that? 95 or 96. 95? 96. 96 this fiscal year uh, by June 30th. Mm -hmm. the, the money for the additional 100 beds kicks in July 1st of this year for fiscal 19. Uh, we are already expect to make awards in the next month or two, or have they been next month? Yes, in the next month, the awards for the money that we don't have yet will be made in the next month or so. So then those uh, providers, the additional 100 beds that kick in on July 1st will have a full year to do the, the certification and, and all the other things that are required because it gives them a full year to get up and running. So I'm confident by the end of fiscal 19, June 30th of 2019, 753 beds will be funded and certified. Okay. And, um, and this past fall, you released a request for proposals to identify service providers for pre-existing RHY beds. Right. right. Um, uh, and so um, you had supported prior in, in the prior administration, right? Right. Supported prior to the administration's current expansion process. DYCD also released an RFP for drop-in and street outreach program providers. Um, have you announced these awardees yet? No. I and are there any new providers who have not previously been involved in RHY? I don't think the decisions, the announcements can be made for another month or so, because I think they're going through the procurement process and they're being vetted, so I can't give you any details. But there will be no disruption services. Um, uh, you know, th this is an area, particularly residential services, not many people want to do this service. I mean, when, when uh, Susan and I started uh, at DYCD uh, in 2005 and 2006, you could count on one hand the number of uh, nonprofits that would be willing to do this. It's, it's, it's uh, challenging work, working with a highly vulnerable population. We managed to double it to two hands, and now we're at, I think, three hands, where we're able to bring in new providers. And we're constantly looking for people to apply because we know this is important work that needs to be done, but you can't do it if you don't have people willing to do the service. So um, we, we, we can share with you the announcements when it's made in about a month or so. Uh, but that, at this point, there's nothing more I can share. Yeah, um, in the um, preliminary ma mayor's management report, um, the performance, much of the performance around RHY um, is measured in terms of the ability to transfer children from crisis shelters into what um, the document describes as suitable environments. You know, um, for the sake of PMMR, how does DYCD define a suitable environment? So Susan will answer this question. We appreciate that there's been more attention to the MMR lately, especially from our advocates at the Coalition for Homeless Youth, and we're looking more closely about these measures. Traditionally, this measure has been in place since 2002, where we had a much smaller subset of beds. And as we've grown, I do think it's appropriate that we're looking at this fresh. What we've basically noted as a suitable environment is that, you know, from a provider perspective, if I'm operating a crisis shelter or I'm operating a till, my, my job is to provide that young person with the supports they need in like the major life skill areas and transition them to the next step, whatever is in the best interest of that young person. So we have incorporated in that measure of suitable environment virtually all placements that are made with a young person. And the young people who aren't included in that measure is a young person who walks away without a placement, without a next step. So it's really demonstrating the difference between a, a young person who's been handed off to the next 
safe location versus young people who, as they often do, remember they're 18, 19, 20 year olds, who just leave and the, the provider hasn't been able to successfully move them to the next spot, they don't come back. So that the measure, it's a percentage of young people who've been moved to the next uh, location. We've also invited advocates um, to advise us on how they would like to look at that measure fresh and we're open to, to those suggestions. Um, is one of the um, measures, uh, uh, is a criminal justice placement considered a suitable environment? I, I, look, metric? I looked at the data, we do have very few, but we have a small handful of young people who were be, went to incarceration, very small, I think we had one person in the last fiscal year, and it was grouped in the suitable environment. And I can certainly see why advocates would say, is that really representing a suitable environment? Again, the way we framed it was that a young person, you know, moved on to a known location that was appropriate. Obviously, that's not our goal and we're open to modifying that measure. I, I was gonna say, are you moving to um, reevaluate the metrics that you're using to define a suitable environment? And um, will that be um, eliminated from that, that sort of cohort of yes. suitable? We absolutely are. And just keeping in mind that we wanted to recognize that young people ha have so many different trajectories and we wanted to value the work of the provider that some things may be beyond their control and not to penalize them when that's a situation that happens because very often the young person would come back after detention and continue to get services, that kind of situation. So our intent was to show that the provider work was was yeah, being done, I, but we can improve it. Mm -hmm. and I, I, th I think it's, it's wonderful that we want, you know, to encourage our providers to continue to provide care and not to, to penalize them for um, situations outside of their control, however, to ever consider um, a criminal justice placement as a suitable environment is, <laughs> it just defies, you know, logic for me. And so um, I'm glad to hear that you're willing to revisit the metrics that you're using and that that will not be considered a suitable environment. Am I correct in saying we're that? Gonna, we're definitely gonna take recommendations and we want to improve it. So thank you, we appreciate that. All right, we will follow up. Um, Please do. And we'll be watching the PMMR, okay. Um, yeah, yes. I, I will have a follow-up question about the data. Okay, council member Chin. Yes, I just want to have a follow-up question on the homeless and runaway youth bed. I mean, from the the last hearing, and we were talking to some of the providers, uh, because from your testimony from DYCD, you said that you you don't have a waiting list, right? There is always a bed available. But then when I was talking to uh, some of the young people and, and the providers, is that specific shelter that targets a special population, let's say the uh, LGBTQ uh, youth, those are the programs that do have a waiting list because the kids, some of the, the young people, they feel a little bit more, you know, safe and secure in, in the specialized shelter. Uh, so in that, does, do ICD, how do you deal with a situation like that to make sure that the provider that do have waiting lists, that you do, you know, meet that need? Um, and not just saying that you, you have no waiting list and you can get a bed anytime. We, we, Commissioner has testified on this in the past and we've never testified that every site always has capacity for every young person or that every provider. So two, two things with respect to that. We're looking at the system overall to make sure we have a bed and we are looking at the, at the uh, subgroups of young people, male or female or pregnant and parenting, LGBT, um, we, we look to see that we have a bed available. And I, I won't testify that we're there 100% of the time, but we are, we're very close. We're, we're, vir we're able to place virtually every young person every 21 at this, at this moment. What we, what we say, have been saying to providers over the last three years is like there is funding and we are growing. So if you as a provider are experiencing a wait list, of course we've been encouraging providers to develop new capacity, to develop new sites. 
We have been, Randy Scott has been supporting providers, you know, every year, multiple providers. To, that's how we've been successful growing. So we are paying attention to subgroups. Um, when we testify, we don't testify that every shelter has capacity, but that we have a bed for a young person somewhere in the city. Okay, thank you. Does that, that answer your question, Council Member Chair? Now. For now? Okay. Thank you. She gave you a pass. <laughs> Um, I, I want to, in the interest of time, um, Commissioner, uh, we, um, we have 30 people who want to testify and talk about um, this budget. And so um, we're going to um, refrain from asking the rest of our questions. Um, but what I am going to do is have them emailed to you and we would like a response to, to the questions. Certainly. Um, and so I would also like to make a request that um, you, your staff, be able to be here to listen to the testimony of uh, the people who are out here on the front lines uh, dealing with the issues of youth development. And so I wanna thank you for being here today to testify, and with that, I will call the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna ask the next panel to be, um, to come up. Uh, Brian Licata from UAU, Walter Sipser from Samaritans of New York, Jesse Lehman, or Lyman, uh, New York City Employment and Training Coalition, Annie Minguez, Minguez, Good Shepherds, and Faith Benham from UJA Federation New York, um, and we're gonna ask you to come up. We'll, um, we're gonna ask everyone to keep their testimony to three minutes, no, not more than three minutes. We're gonna run the clock. And um, thank all of you for staying, all of you who are, have been patiently waiting. And so, um, will you speak into the mic, identify yourself and the organization that you're representing um, before you start your testimony? And we can begin. Thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, my name is Brian Licata. I'm from United Activities on Staten Island. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Listening to DYCD present, uh, listening to the comments that you made, we also echo a lot of the same feelings. Um, currently, United Activities serves a lot of different programs on Staten Island. Uh, we have an OSY program, an ISY program. We have a young adult literacy program. 
Uh, we have our SYP program, Work, Learn, Grow, Lattice for Leaders, Sonic, Compass, and the myriad of other alphabetical letters. Um, with these programs, we are serving an SS of 15,000 youth on Staten Island every year. What we've seen is that in between the budget dance, our youth are strapped. Our parents are strapped. Um, but we've noticed that over the course of the last few years, City Council has been fantastic with stepping in, um, specifically with certain programs. I'd like to thank you for everything that you've done with the Work, Learn, Grow program. I was very sad to see that it was not in the mayor's budget. Um, I'd like to concentrate on the out-of-school youth program and the Work, Learn, Grow program. Out-of-school youth serves young adults ages 16 to 24 that are no longer in school and are currently not working. It tries to give them an avenue to get back into school or to get a career, not a part-time job. This program is not funded to the level that it needs to be. Currently, we are serving 60 students on Staten Island. 60. There are 5,000 youth on Staten Island, ages 18 to 24, that fit that demographic. We are not putting a dent at all. Not only is it not funded to the service level, it is not funded to the dollar level. We cannot do the work that we need to do. The job is fantastic. But what is needed is the mental services. What is needed is the housing services. We can do everything that we want with training youth for jobs. If they do not have the wraparound services that are needed, it's for nothing. The Work, Learn, Grow program has been a great counterpart to the summer youth program. It enables youth to work an additional 25 weeks. It gives employers a chance to train them and hire them on their own. The employers still come back to summer youth. In fact, over the last few years, they value the summer youth program more than ever. Without the Work, Learn, Grow program, you are indirectly taking over $18 million out of the New York City economy that the youth put back into the economy. This program is a year-to-year -year program. It is not contracted. It is not easy to run as a provider. It is not easy for a school to utilize or for youth to utilize. These programs need to be funded at the correct level if we are to serve New York City youth. I thank you for your time today. Next. Turn your microphone on, please. There we go. Good afternoon. My name is Walter Sipser. I'm public education associate with the Samaritans of New York. I want to thank uh, Chair Rose and the members of the City Council's Committee on Youth Services for the opportunity to present testimony today on behalf of Samaritan's Suicide Prevention Center. As Samaritan's Public Education Associate, I'm proud to say that Samaritan's has a long history of working collaboratively with the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, going back over 25 years to our work helping to train and create youth line. To this day, DYCD continues to rely on Samaritans for technical support and professional development training for its staff and the youth they serve, tied to suicide awareness and prevention planning and for knowledge of current research, best practices, and community resources tied to youth, mental health. In many ways, Samaritans work parallels that of DYCD as we both provide support to New York City youth who are struggling with mental health and behavioral problems. They say the children are our future. When it comes to violent, self-harming, and suicidal behavior, the question remains, how well are we preparing our youth for that future? The CDC reports suicide is the second leading cause of death of teenagers, third for those 15 to 24, and fourth for 10 to 14-year-olds. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey states that 18% of New York City high school students considered suicide last year, and as many as 8% attempt suicide. The highest rates among young female Hispanics and Asians, LGBTQ adolescents, and youth living in poverty. Add that the highest rates of self-inflicted injuries, opioid abuse, and related hospitalizations in New York are found in 15 to 19-year-olds, and the need to increase our young people's understanding of suicide and how to cope with crisis is imperative. Samaritan's Caring Community Suicide Prevention Education Project, which we have submitted to the city, to the council speaker for funding fiscal year 2019 addresses this particular issue. We hope you will consider supporting it. Having operated New York City's 24-hour suicide hotline for over 35 years, 
and developed the city's first suicide prevention public education program and trained over 40,000 teachers, guidance counselors, social workers, and other health care providers working with at-risk youth, Samaritans is in the best position to address this problem. Suicide has increased in New York City for the past three years. The DOE tells us that they have seen significant increases over last year in the number of incidents involving self-harming by students. Every year, one in five New Yorkers experiences a mental disorder and 60% never receive care, destroying lives and families and costing New York State 1.8 billion from suicide alone. Something must be done and it starts with our, our young people. We need to address the needs of New York City's underserved youth, provide alternatives to the standard programs and services available, and engage those community partners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the line of questioning earlier today of the DYCD Commissioner. Uh, my name is Annie Minguez. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for Good Shepherd Services. Um, we're not only a summer camp provider, but also a runaway homeless youth provider. And I wanted to just um, shorten my, my statement to be sure to allow time for others. Um, Good Shepherd Services is also a member of the camp campaign for children and uh, with some of my colleagues that are here today, we're once again thanking the council for ensuring that all summer uh, after school programs include summer programming um, and that the uh, executive budget that the mayor will be uh, putting out next month includes um, at least those 34,000 middle school slots. Um, you know, two, about two weeks ago, the city council passed um, an important package of runaway and homeless youth bills which would increase the age of eligibility for runaway homeless youth services from 21 to 25 and extend the amount of uh, time youth can remain in runaway homeless shelters. We anticipate these bills will become law. This is uh, momentous, momentous and we thank the council for uh, all they've been doing in that area. We at Good Shepherd Services, uh, of course, urge the administration to include funding to address this new need in, income, in the incoming executive budget um, since this is going to be a new population that we're going to have to serve. Um, and again, uh, we're asking that the administration add 10.2 million of funding to enable DYCD to add 100 beds for 21 to 24 year olds, add uh, 15 runaway homeless youth housing specialists, create two new drop-in centers and increase crisis till contracts by 7%. And I know that other folks will be testifying and can provide more information on that. Good Shepherd Services is also part of the uh, administration's nonprofit resiliency committee. So I wanted to be sure to again thank the council for its le leadership in championing for years uh, to increase funding for human services contracts. These investments to the human services workforce across the city recognize the role those providing critical services to New Yorkers in need are uh, to the progress of our city. Having said that, um, we have received uh, COLA contracts from DYCD. Uh, uh, we received notification on our uh, two beacon contracts that we have. Uh, however, no time frame has been given and some agent, in some cases, some agencies have not provided uh, additional information about that. Um, just in very short, Good Shepherd Services uh, supports uh, the following investments in FY19, include trend factor cost escalation formulas in all new human services procurements uh, for the duration of the contract, and develop a framework to increase all contracts and all new procur uh, procurements with a, a minimum of 15% indirect cost rates, 37% fringe rates, 10% increase for occupancy program space costs, and 10% increase to ca uh, uh, casualty and uh, liability insurance. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Do you have um, print copies? I do. I'll, I'll Could you make sure that we get some for the record? Yes. yes Thank, I you. Will. Thank you. Thank um, you. And uh, before you start, um, mm -hmm. is there anyone still here from the administration? Okay. All right. I'm watching you. <laughs> okay. Uh, next. Hi. Uh, well, good afternoon, Chairperson Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services, uh, Council Member Chin. Uh, my name is Faith Bam, and I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UGA Federation of New York. 
I'm gonna switch because this is. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. That's a little better. Okay. Um, on behalf of UGA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the importance of maintaining and expanding services for the youth of New York City. Established over 100 years ago, UGA Federation of New York is one of the nation's largest local philanthropies. We support nearly 100 nonprofit organizations serving those that are most vulnerable and in need of programs and services. Youth focused programs, our network of nonprofit partners oversee, funded by DYCD, include summer youth employment programs, Compass and Sonic programs, Beacons, and Cornerstones. Um, we would like to thank the City Council for its efforts and commitment in the fiscal year 2018 budget to increase the funding for human service contracts. These investments, once fully implemented, will better allow for human service workers across the city to provide critical services to New Yorkers in need. This year, however, there remain a number of areas that are either unfunded or underfunded and will challenge our nonprofit partners as they attempt to serve youth across New York City. Um, in my written testimony, I talk about how we're looking for a restore for funding for Compass Elementary After School programs, which is $16 million. Um, ensuring elementary after school programs are funded at the same rates um, and also the importance of funding the minimum wage mandate for summer youth employment programs. Um, but what I want to talk about very quickly is um, there was a lot of discussion um, between DYCD and the council um, as far as what providers can do when they get money at certain point um, in the budget cycle. So I have an example here from the summer of 2016 when the mayor did not include funding for the middle school summer programs in the preliminary or the executive budget. Um, thankfully, the city council pushed for this funding and it was included in the adopted budget. Um, so the adopted budget, the administration put in 17 million for 26,000 children. This was from one year only. But because this came through in June, it was really challenging for our uh, staff to, to for for our organizations to hire staff and then fill the slots in time for July summer camp. Um, so I think our Good Shepherd partners, um, people from Children's Aid, UJA, um, UJA is a part of the Campaign for Children. We all are amazed by the work that our providers do, but there are some times where if you're just not given the right time and the resources to prepare these programs, you just can't do them in a way that you want to. Um, so I just really wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions, um, any questions for I, this panel? I, I should actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so I, much. I think oh, I have I'm to actually sorry. testify. Yes. I'm sorry. So I'll sorry. be quick. Don't worry. No, We're no. five of us. We, it was hard, easy to lose track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, but thank you, uh, Chairwoman Rose, and, and thank you, uh, Councilwoman Chin, for having us. My name is Jesse Lehman. I'm here from the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. Uh, and. Uh, by and large, we want to echo what many of our colleagues and peers at our, a range of provider organizations, many of whom are members of the Employment and Training Coalition, will have to say about a range of topics. Uh, in particular, I'll just sort of list a few that I know have been or will be covered extensively that we fully support and, and uh, appreciate your efforts to push the, uh, the department to fully fund SYEP, Work, Learn, Grow, uh, and literacy programs, both for adults and for and young adults, uh, are, are vital components uh, of, a, of a, a full set of city services that prepare young people on a pathway towards uh, the workforce. So the Employment and Training Coalition represents all the groups in New York that help people get jobs, that help people get the skills that they need to get meaningful employment. Uh, and uh, we certainly see that New York City's untapped workforce is by and large young people and adults who do not have or have not yet received the level of education and skills development that they need to get those really good jobs that are available and that our, that our economy does provide. Uh, and we need to make sure that we provide city services that help them get there. Uh, the one thing I will testify on that I don't think will be as extensively covered by other testifiers here today, and it fits in with that larger narrative, is uh, the disappointment that we have that DYCD has not taken up uh, more of a responsibility of uh, playing a role within the larger framework of the Mayor's Career Pathways Plan. Uh, the Career Pathways Plan, which is the blueprint and vision for workforce services in New York City and is one that the community supports, uh, laid out certain benchmarks to be hit by 2020. 
Uh, and one of the most important of those and very relevant to youth are, are what are called bridge programs, which are programs that help people that are uh, uh, missing a basic skill, either literacy or numeracy or English language skills, get those skills so that they can then get on their way to more advanced training or a career. Uh, and the city laid out a, a benchmark of $60, $60 million in annual funding by 2020. Uh, most re the most recent budget had less than $10 million. So they are well short of that goal. We believe DYCD should be the home of a sizable portion of that $60 million, perhaps approximately 15 million or one quarter of it. Uh, and we would like to see that be one area that DYCD would advocate for themselves and that you would help them advocate for uh, in the future. Uh, and that is something that we think would be complementary with some of the programs that already exist. There are literacy programs and other programs that could be transformed into full bridge programs with additional funding. Uh, so that's something we'd like to bring up uh, for future consideration, and thank you for, for giving us this time. Um, and, and we will include that um, in the questions that we ask the administration. Great. And thank so you very much. Be, you know, we'll be glad to get back to you with an answer. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next panel. Sheila Wells, Sports and Arts and School Foundation, Chrissy Odelin, New York Roadrunners, Madison Hernandez, Girl Scouts of Greater New York, Kate Banks, um, Power Play NYC, Daisy Tomes, or Tomes, Power Play NYC, Scott Daly, NYJTL, and Brenda and Felicia Cannon, parent and daughter, talking about New York Roadrunners. That's a pretty large panel. Um, so, wow. Um, as soon as you uh, get seated, could we um, get you to identify, um, to state your name and your organization and begin your testimony? Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Madison Hernandez. I'm 11 years old and I'm a proud Girl Scout. I joined my current troop at seven years old as a Brownie and I'm currently a first year cadet. Throughout my years of being a Girl Scout, I've always found that developing a sense of leadership and self-confidence is very crucial in the real world. Girl Scouts have showed me again and again that I should be proud to be a girl and a woman and that I do have the power to make an impact on the world. According to a study made by the AAUW, American Association of University Women, women in leadership positions within businesses are a minority, considering that only 5% of women are CEOs of S&P companies. It's important that the children of today are taught well, because after all, they are the people of tomorrow. These lyrics say it all. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. These are lyrics from Whitney Houston's song, Way to Solve of All. This just goes on to show that the theme of children deserving a way to get a head start on their future is popular in pop culture too. However, not many children, especially girls due to the large gender, gender gap in leadership, have access to proper guidance or training to help themselves become the strong, confident woman they can be. Girl Scouts provides guidance and training to build the courage, character, and confidence of girls who can make the world a better place. Girl Scouts encourages girls like me, whether they're a Girl Scout or not, to be a G-I-R-L or girl every day. G-I-R-L stands for go-getter, innovator, risk-taker, and leader. If you give money to the Girl Scouts of Greater New York, they can use the money to support the incredible programs they offer to girls. For example, GSGNY's Breaking the Code and Fundamental Robotics program expo exposes girls to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields, where the fastest growing jobs with highest earning potential are. Each year, GSGNY adds similar programs or improves their current programs to expose even more girls to STEM careers and so that they can develop their communication and teamwork skills. 
The Breaking the Code and Fundamental Robotics program are only some ways GSGNY wants to promote some of these important skills to girls, whether they're at the young age of five or about to head off to college at 18. Your help to fund these amazing programs would be greatly appreciated by girls in GSGNY. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sheila Wells, Sports and Arts and Schools Foundation. I am the Director of Programs and Special Initiatives. First, let me start by thanking City Council for your unwavering support. Centra Investment, Sports and Arts and Schools Foundation has been able to substantially impact the lives of hundreds of thousands of young people. Currently, SASF is serving 35,000 youth in um, 2018 in over 210 programs, providing programs that reach almost every New York City Council District. 85% of our principals state that SASF supports student academics. 85% of our principals recognize that SASF supports the development of 21st century skills. 90% of our principals report that SASF supplements their school with skill-based enrichment activities, sports, arts, STEM, and leadership. In an effort to maintain the highest quality of service, SASF employees, employees are paid an equitable rate of no less than $15 an hour for, for over 1,700 New York City residents. As the 21st century matures, it becomes more apparent that the skills needed to thrive in the next half century are deeply embedded in the realms of science, technology, engineering, art, and math, STEAM. The lack of access to high quality program that incorporates STEAM during the summer months leaves New York's neediest families without the opportunities afforded for more affluent New Yorkers. SASF is answering this challenge with its 2018 summer camp theme, Generation Next, by leveraging its experience experience providing quality STEAM, academic supports, and arts programs to New York City's youth. Our goal is to position SASF summer camps to support the growth of the 21st century learning skills. With the support of City Council, SASF will provide children an experience that otherwise would only be available to families who can afford private technology camps at a cost of $950 a week per child. With the request additional funding of $500,000, SASF will be positioned to meet the rising costs of its existing summer camp programs and increase its camp's budgets to reflect actual operating costs, increase the hours of service provided to every city council camp by 20%, introduce new STEAM programs to every city council camp, create five new STEAM camps, one in each borough, which will incorporate the Common Core Standards and Next Generation Science Standards through a combination of workshops and field trips. SASF, its students and families are extraordinarily grateful for the support provided by New York City Council. The needs of our families inspire us to introduce new elements to the City Council camp. I ask on behalf of the 35,000 youngsters that we serve to support our $1.5 million full year 2019 funding request in advance, and thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chrissy O'Dallon, and I'm the Senior Director for Youth and Community Programs from New York Roadrunners. Um, I'm here with some of my colleagues, as well as one of our parents and participants, um, and we um, want to thank you for allowing us to testify today. Um, our mission at New York Roadrunners is to help and inspire people through running. Um, I'm here today to talk about physical education and um, how it's falling short in serving New York City's children and meeting the New York State standards, particularly those in low-income communities, and where that's leaving our students in danger of becoming obese and remaining habitually inactive through their lives. While New York Road Owners is best known for producing the TCS New York City Marathon, our organization is also the largest nonprofit provider of free youth fitness programs in New York City. We've been providing these programs since 1999, and in the last school year, we've, our programs, events, and resources touched the lives of 115,000 youth in New York City across 810 unique schools and community centers. I've been working here since 99 and seen our support grow, and I've also witnessed the significant progress made in the city's physical education program, but there's still a long road to make quality physical education and fitness accessible to all children. 
We're devoted to making that happen. Our free year-round program is designed to help all kids pre-K through grade 12 build their confidence, motivation, and desire to be physically active for life or to become physically literate. We emphasize the importance of reading and math literacy, but movement needs to be accorded the same importance. Without complete and comprehensive physical education, children often only take part in few activities and never develop the range of movement skills that allow them to enjoy and feel confident in participating in physical activity in the long term. We're in the midst of a health and obesity crisis in New York City, especially for our children. Physical activity lays the ground, schools lays the groundwork for a healthy life. It's not an extra, it's a critical service. As you may be aware, last year the city responded to this crisis by announcing the universal PE initiative that promises a designated PE space for all New York City schools by 2021. Um, this vital role um, in physical activity has on a child's life, and we need to make sure that programming is um, included in those spaces as well. Um, PE in schools needs the support and NYR is dedicated to providing that free of cost on a large scale. We are requesting $500,000 in initiative support for our signature youth program, Rising New York Runners, which is on track to serve um, similar numbers as we did last year. Every single city council district in New York City has schools and community centers benefiting from this program. We did previously receive generous initiative support of $250,000 under the Council's Obesity Prevention Initiatives for six years. Unfortunately, that was cut from the FY17 budget, effectively defunding New York Roadrunners. During that time, we more than doubled our free service to New York City schools because we recognize the immediate and ongoing need for PE programming that works for each school's unique needs and limitations. With our 2019 request, we are hoping to restore and increase our funding under a citywide initiative so we continue to offer our year-round programs for free. Thank you very much. Thank you. And those of you who are testifying for programs that are not DYCD funded, I encourage you to also speak to DOE or DOH so that um, it can get on to their budget priorities, okay? Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Cannon and I'm from Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I wanted to share with you today the impact Roadrunners has had on me and my daughter. Felicia is 13 years old and an eighth grader in MS 577. When she wanted to run, I could not help her, I'm disabled. She found her youth program at school and started participating. When that wasn't enough, we started going through their websites. We found other programs that they were offering. She joined Roadrunners Open Runs. We started at the Brooklyn location. When, when we first got there, she suffered from anxiety and was very quiet. She sat there, just watched the people run, never moved. It wasn't until some, the run director came up to her and asked her would she like to join. And that was it, it started. From there, we now participate in three different open runs. She is the youth ambassador for New York Road Runners, and she's only getting started. Last week she participated in nationals and she got an academic scholarship to McClancy High School where she will be attending next year and she can take it from here. Good afternoon, my name is Felicia and I am one of the participants in the Rising New York Roadrunners Youth Programs. And in about February of 2016, I joined the track team in my school where I learned all of these new activities that I never thought I would ever do. And they taught me how to properly stretch and how to not get injured. And then when I did go to the open runs, I applied those new skills that I had learned so that I knew exactly how to move on from there and make sure that I would be healthy so I could continue doing what I had found out I really loved. And from there, it kind of went to everyone was like, wow, like she's really young. This is really cool. I wish I had started when I was that young. And I was like, different people each week were running with me and teaching me new skills and teaching me how to do stuff properly and saying, no, 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 don't do that. That will get you injured. Let's do it this way and see how it feels. And that was really helpful for me. And I've really continued to work from that. And now, like she said, I am competing in nationals. And yes, 
I'm cool. competing in nationals, and I had previously done three half marathons where I'd used all those new skills to complete them. <laughs> and it's been a really fun experience. And I am hoping that when I am 14 years old, I will be able to volunteer at their events to help the children that are younger than me so that maybe one day they can have experiences like I did. And I would really like for the youth of the newer generations to get these experiences like I did. And it really helped me and uh, changed me a lot. And I am moving on to do good things, I hope. Thank you and congratulations. Do you Thank think you. New York Roadrunners could help me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Thank we you. can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, could the next group, yes, testify? Give us your name and your uh, organizational affiliation. Thank you. Thank you. You can begin. Turn on your mic. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Banks. I'm with PowerPlay NYC, the Strategic Partnerships and External Affairs Director. I'm here with Power Play participant Daisy Torres, and we'd like to begin by thanking the council for taking time today to hear our testimony and for their crucial leadership in support of our work in youth development. Power Play advances the lives of girls through sports by developing skills to grow physically, emotionally, and academically stronger. We create opportunities for girls ages 6 to 21 by partnering with schools and community-based organizations to conduct after-school and summer programs that emphasize physical fitness and education. Using sports as our hook, we build girls' confidence and resiliency from the inside out and create safe spaces where girls learn from each other and from strong female role models. Power Play fills a critical service gap for young women of color in New York City who face structural barriers limiting their access to valuable resources and making them particularly vulnerable. Our programs for girls and young women help to fill the gap through a continuum of services beginning with girls as young as six and intensifying as they mature. We believe that New York City's young women are a valuable source of talent and leadership, and in order to thrive, they need safe spaces to be active, to think creatively, and to talk about issues that affect them. We're grateful that the City Council acknowledges the importance of prioritizing organizations for girls, and we are here to highlight the ways in which our organization's programs, particularly the STARS Citywide Girls Initiative, are extremely necessary. It's now more than ever that we must not lose sight of this need and mission. For the fourth consecutive year, Power Play is the lead agency in the, in the sports training and role models for success citywide girls initiative, funded at 1.2 million by the council, which offers the city of New York a unique opportunity to support the healthy development of thousands of girls and young women of color. Created in 2015 with the support of the council, the STARS initiative is a collaboration of nine leading N New York City nonprofits, helping girls and young women of color overcome barriers to success, gain access to high quality out of school activities, and develop as leaders in their communities. The nine partners, Girls Right Now, Groundswell, Lower East Side Girls Club, Power Play, Row New York, Sadie Nash Leadership Project, The Armory Foundation, Figure Skating in Harlem, and Girls for Gender Equity, all leaders in the out of, out of school time space, will collectively serve more than 4,000 girls this year in deep in programming. From July 2017 to February 2018, STARS has already served 4,008 youth. That is young people being offered opportunities in every single city council district in New York. In the initiative's fourth year and with the current state of affairs, STARS and organizations like STARS, refunding is more critical than ever. We're seeking renewed funding at 1.2 million to deepen programming to continue to address girls' needs in the vulnerable immigrant youth community, offer more resources for the LGBTQ community, and continue to explore avenues and programming to address topics like violence and relationships, health, trauma, and social activism. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Daisy Torres and I'm a senior at Francis Lewis High School in Queens, New York. Um, at Francis Lewis High School, I'm part of the Gateway Honors Institute, which focuses on helping low-income minority students through internship and enrichment opportunities during the summer. Gateway was actually the first program that encouraged me to do something valuable with my summer as my parents couldn't afford to send me to any summer camp or program 
like my other friend's parents could. Power Play was the first time I became acquainted with girls from all five boroughs of New York City. And not only that, they exposed me to any physical uh, activity or sport possible. And it let my introvert self become, you know, a, I don't want to say acquainted, exposed to a lot of fun activities, but most importantly, get to know girls who were going through the same struggle as I was. My neighborhood wasn't always keen on encouraging girls to pursue college, as most girls dropped out and went straight to work to support their families. Power Play became the first place that exposed me to unlimited support by women for women, all with the dream of attending college and inspiring girls in their neighborhood to do the same and break the barrier. Power Play allowed me to cherish my introvert personality, always pushing me to feel like I could do anything. Having the opportunity to coach younger girls the next summer and learn from their own experience, I realized I had to make the path to college easier for them as they are the next generation. As the years go by, women are now being praised for their strong and intelligent characters, and I hope this continues as the next generation prepares for their next internship, college, or career. Programs like Power Play enable girls to think of others and thus think of themselves in a better light, realize their own potential. The Power Play community has motivated me to join nonprofits such as the Opportunity Network and Leadership Enterprise for Diverse America, both programs that took place during the summer, and I can say that I can spend so much valuable time there. With this endless support, I applied to Princeton University, a place I never imagined myself, but have been blessed with an acceptance last December. Every girl will face a separate struggle at one point in their life, but Power Play encourages girls to view this as a way to realize their own potential. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Scott Daly, and I am the director of the Free Community Tennis Programs of NYJTL, that's the New York Junior Tennis and Learning. We are legally incorporated and known as the New York Junior Tennis League. Um, let me start by saying that uh, I'm just gonna deviate from the, from the testimony that you all have there in front of you. You can all see it, and I'd rather talk to you from what I know, what I see, what I experience throughout the city. We meet the needs of New York City kids. Last year, we reached, we served over 85,000 children in all of the 51 council districts throughout the city. We, are, we operate all four seasons of the year, all 12 months of the year. Our programs are free across the board. Kids don't need to bring any equipment with them. They don't need to know, have any instruction. When I tell parents all they have to do is bring their child to us, with sneakers on their feet and a smile on their face to see the astonishment that I get back from them. We are open to all, as I said. We do not close out our programs to anybody. So whereas the season, our spring season is going to start beginning in, at the end of April, it doesn't matter when you come. It's a registration. It's not an application. There is no waiting list. We turn nobody away. Whenever you come, you're gonna play, and we do this only because of the continued support that we've gotten from the New York City Council. Uh, what do we do? Well, we have our free community tennis programs, as I just told you, open from kids for kids from five to 18 years of age. We run something called the School Time Tennis Program. We'll reach over 250 to 300 New York City physical education teachers. We invite them up, we train them, we give them equipment to take back to their schools to utilize during the school day. We give them a full curriculum. I know how overworked these guys are. We give them the lesson plans to help them do it. Why? Introduce kids. Most of the kids that we have are low, uh, on a lower income scale. Latinos, blacks, Asians, immigrant families. They would never have be exposed to this other than through these programs, especially the introduction they're gonna get in school through, the, through these teachers. Um, I heard before questions about SYEP, uh, Summer Youth Program. Most of our kids, are, are, everybody that works for us, by the way, in community tennis, are their part-time workers. 60% of our staff during the summer 
are going to be kids who have come up through our program. They're either currently in high school or just now entering colleges throughout the city. We take from within, we build from within. Before I close, I want you to know that we've been funded in the past under the physical education and fitness initiative, we've gotten $800,000. This year, we've increased our ask, lest I be accused of not asking for more, of $1.2 million this year. Um, with this, we'll Thank continue you. to serve every district and bring more programs to more things, Saturday programs. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And our next panel, um, uh, Natasha Jones, the LGBT Center, um, Cesar Zaniga, the Parent Child Home Program, City for, City's First Readers, Jamie Polovich um, from the Coalition for Homeless Youth, Gregory Brenda from United Neighborhood Housings, Housing, Grant Cowles, Citizens Committee for Children, Alex Carrizado, Center for Family Life, and Diana Noriega, the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families and City's First Readers. Um, please come up. Um, well, those of you that are at the at the table already, please um, turn the mic on and identify yourself and you and your organization, and you can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, my name is Natasha Jones and I serve as the youth leadership, the director of youth leadership and engagement at the LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and community center or the center. And I'm thankful uh, to the youth service committee's chair Rose and members of the community for the time today, thank you. As the federal government continually works to eradicate uh, LGBT and queer youth people um, from the fabric of society, the need for high quality youth programming and funding in New York City that prioritizes LGBTQ youth heightens as each day passes. Importantly, high quality youth programming must be inclusive of LGBTQ youth from all different walks of life and no matter what their skill levels. We must allow all LGBTQ youth a fighting chance to overcome multiple facets of discrimination they face for being LGBTQ. In tandem with other identities they may hold, including race, religion, and disability, just to name a few. Recognizing this, Center Youth utilizes a multi-tier approach, ensuring that members of our youth program are equipped with a community of peers, academic support, and leadership development skills, all of which are critical in helping them learn to lead healthy, successful lives. Creating or finding safe spaces that do not judge, but rather celebrate and uplift youth for their sexual orientation and gender identity and expression can be extremely difficult. This complexity leads many center youth participants to seeking an environment where they can find friends, mentors, and role models that are part of the LGBTQ community. As you know, there is a great power in a young person seeing positive role models experiencing affirmative life outcomes by people that may look like them, sound like them, or come from a similar familial upbringing. Center youth's community of young folks and alumni is a great example of just this. By cultivating an identity-specific drop-in discussion group, youth freely examine the full spectrum of what their orientation, gender identity, and expression can be without judgment, without shame, and most importantly, alongside community, not alone. Because building community is an ongoing process, center youth are encouraged to expand in the ways which they multiply their friend group by participating in center's academic and career development programs. Center youth learn a myriad of academic career and leadership development sk skills, including a personal or a professional elevator pitch, how to write a cover letter, and how to facilitate a drop-in group with a strong focus on economic empowerment. The center youth programming also teaches participants how to become financially dependent. So the question is not why should the city fund programs that serve LGBTQ youth like the centers, but rather how can it not? By funding and prioritizing program that focuses on LGBTQ youth, the city allows youth to define success for themselves in a space that dramatically increases their chances at success. 
LGBTQ youth frequently do this inside of their schools or in their homes. Thank you for this time. Thank you so much. My name is Alexander Cruzado. I'm an assistant group leader at the Center for Family Life Pro Beacon Program at PS503-506 <clears throat> in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I worked as an SYP counselor for two years since the age of 15, as I am now 17. In the context of a summer camp where over 100 middle schoolers were participants because of funding that the, the center received through summer expansion. I didn't grow up in a situation like that of the kids I worked with. I had a good home. I never had to worry about eating. I never had to worry about where my next meal would come from. I never had to worry about the home I was going back to. But so many of the children I worked with did, and essentially that made this job so meaningful to me. The simple fact that I could serve as a role model for kids, that I could show them that a young Hispanic man could go on to achieve academically and actually do something with their lives made me feel like every day at work was saving a gr greater purpose. The boys that I worked with oftentimes didn't have ro male role models in their lives, and I served as that. I served as a role model who was able to maintain high averages, play sports, and lead myself to the prospect of an Ivy League education. In some cases, between the beginning of summer and closings, I had situations where kids themselves had become so attached they were sad to have summer end simply because those bonds had ended. Working with kids every day and doing that job every day of the summer was not only meaningful for them, but also for me as an SYP counselor. I'd like to thank DYCD for maintaining SYP funding and I'm advocating for the reinstatement of summer expansion. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Grant Coles, and I am Senior Policy Associate for Youth Justice at Citizens Committee for Children. CCC is an independent, multi-issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. We don't do direct services or accept government funds. We just advocate for kids. I would like to thank City Council Services Committee Chair Deborah Rose and as well as all the members of the, city, uh, the Youth Services Committee for holding today's hearing. CCC is very grateful for the City Council's long-standing commitment to youth services. The support and investments that the City Council has put into youth services have helped hundreds of thousands of youth and young adults who now form a foundation of our city's workforce and communities. Our gratitude cannot be overstated. We also appreciate the investments Mayor de Blasio and DYCD Commissioner Chong have made in youth services over the past four years, including expanding the middle school after school program, increasing capacity in SYP, and increasing the number and rate for Beacon Community Centers. And while we are very grateful for the administration's past investments in youth services, we are deeply concerned that this year's preliminary budget does not build upon these investments and instead proposes to make some several notable cuts. Um, our written testimony provides a full uh, recommendations uh, in the budget as it relates to youth services, and I simply wanted to quickly summarize a few points. First, we join uh, the council in recommending that all SONIC programs are funded for their summer components. Um, we do want to clarify that it is 34,000, at least 34,000 that are going without summer slots, not the 22,000 as was mentioned. Um, we also want to emphasize that this is a cut. There was money funded last year. Um, I think that goes against the idea that this is not, uh, that it's a priority. Um, we also also wanted to emphasize the location of these cuts as most of these are in high needs districts. Uh, second, we want to, uh, CCC recommends the Compass Elementary after school programs are restored, expanded, baselined, and that the disparate rates are addressed in the, in the budget. Um, we include details in our, in our written testimony. Um, third, we want to ensure that the we, CCC recommends that the rates for addressing the minimum wage increase for summer youth employment program is addressed in the budget, and we also want to see the Work, Learn, and Grow program restored, expanded, and baselined. Um, fourth, we, CCC recommends that there is funding added to address uh, the new needs in the runaway and homeless youth services programs. Uh, the, the bills that were recently passed by the, the City Council to, uh, that uh, expands the capacity um, for runaway and, home youth, runaway and homeless youth services is a great, uh, great advancement, but we specifically ask that $10.2 million is added to enable DYCD to fund uh, the new, this new capacity. Um, and finally, we also, uh, as always, recommend that the City Council initiatives are funded and baselined. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cesar Zuniga, and I'm the Research and Evaluation Director for the Parent-Child Home Program, also known as PCHP. 
PCHP's unique focus is on providing parents with the skills, knowledge, and materials they need to support uh, school readiness skills in their home and helping to build home environments that build children's language, literacy, cognitive, and social emotional skills. In doing this work, we are also helping parents learn what to look for in uh, child care settings, how to identify and access their children's next educational step, and how to support their children's continued academic progress. Our partners in this work in New York City and elsewhere in the, in the state include school districts, public libraries, social service agencies, literacy programs, and community-based organizations. Focusing on school readiness and early literacy support families challenged by poverty, isolation, limited education, and language and literacy barriers. PCHP provides over 46,000 provided over 46,000 home visits and distributed over 23,000 books and educational toys in New York City last year with the assistance from the New York City uh, Council support. Before children enter pre-K or kindergarten, low-income children and low-income from non-native English-speaking families in New York City are likely to be cared for by their family members or in informal settings. They are the least likely children to have access to the information, materials, and activities that will build their school readiness skills and ensure uh, the language and early literacy skills they need to enter the classroom ready to uh, be successful students. For this reason, it is particularly important that in supporting the city's First Readers Initiative, we ensure that they and their families have access to knowledge, skills, and materials that will support their school readiness. PCHP provides critical learning tools, books, and other educational and language stimulating materials to families with two and three year old children. This is an age group that has often uh, that has often very limited access to literacy supports. The program helps families build literacy in rich environment, literacy rich environments in their home. They are visited twice a week in their homes by an early learning specialist or a home visitor who introduces the materials to the family and models for the parents how to read, talk, and play with their children to build language and critical early literacy skills. PCHP staff also uh, connect families to other social services, social service supports when necessary and assist parents in registering their children for pre-K or Head Start. PCHP is pleased to be one of the city's first uh, readers initiative. Working with our partners in this initiative, we are able to not only provide intensive early literacy pro, uh, support to a, a hundred additional families challenged by poverty, isolation, and language and literacy barriers in communities including Astoria, Washington High Sunset Park, Brownsville, uh, and we're just asking for continued support for uh, the city's first readers initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Diana Noriega and I'm the Chief Program Officer for the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families. I am also known as CHCF. So we commend Mayor de Blasio and the City Council for addressing the importance of early childhood education and the need for greater investment in our youngest constituents. A special thank you to Council Members Levin and Reynoso for supporting the City's First Readers Initiative. In light of our national political climate, we would also encourage continued timely discussions around childhood literacy and community investments needed for all children. New York City is currently facing a literacy crisis that disproportionately affects children living in poverty and children of color. Approximately 56% of children under the age of five live in or near poverty in New York City. The third grade ELA reading tests show that 32% of black and Latino children are proficient versus 63% of their white peers across the entire city. So once these children fall behind, we already know what that leads to, and we're talking about the school to prison pipeline in particular. 85% of juveniles who've entered the juvenile justice system are functionally illiterate. So there's a direct connection between what we're doing in early childhood and then what happens in their long-term outcomes. So studies show that if we invest more money in the zero to seven age range, we're setting our young children up for greater success. City's first readers, their aim is to help close the achievement gap by providing literacy tools and materials to parents, to children, and also we particularly do that with early child care providers in their home-based centers. And we do that through a culturally informed lens 
and we provide bilingual books and we train our providers on how to do read out louds and do the literacy work through a more thoughtful and engaging process with the t infants and toddlers they work with. So what we're advocating for particularly is for city council to continue to fund City's First Readers, particularly to increase it to $6 million if possible so we can continue to do meaningful work in our communities that we know will set our children up for success once they enter the K through 12, pre-K even, through 12 system. I wanna talk a little bit, switch gears and talk a little bit about our youth development programs at the committee. We currently have after school programs at PS 59 and PS and MS 279 in the Bronx, one of the poorest congressional districts in the country. We're serving 240 elementary school students and we were able to add an additional 110 students at PS 59 due to Empire State funding. What folks don't realize is actually the advantage after school funding is actually on the chopping block on the state budget level. So we're gonna have to shut down our, our longest running program We've been at that school for 19 years, and now we're at risk of shutting it down. And the other thing that we're really aware of is that our parents are saying that it's even not enough. So at one school, we have a wait list of 95 students and another wait list of 51 students at another school. So to Mar uh, Council Member Margaret Chin's point, we wanna advocate also for universal elementary after school programming and to ex restore baseline that funding to make sure that all of our students have access to quality programming. I'm gonna get up right really fast. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Rose and Council Member Chin and all this, uh, the staff of the council and the whole youth committee, uh, not just for hearing us, which we always appreciate, but just for the amazing advocates you've been uh, for our young people, uh, for coming to the press conferences today and earlier and to really pushing these, uh, these issues. Um, I have written to I wanna thank you for being there and helping to organize the oh, my rally pleasure. today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've submitted a written testimony that goes through kind of each of the points in youth services uh, we were talking about, um, but I'll just kind of give a brief, uh, since a lot of these things have been covered by other speakers, and just say UNH is uh, part of the Campaign for Children and also the Campaign for Summer Jobs. Uh, so all of our asks are aligned with both of those coalitions. Uh, so I think you already know a lot about our ask on, on uh, Summer Sonic and how important that is. I would just really stress the particular thing we hear from our members at um, United Neighborhood Houses is really the importance of stability. Um, and that's why it's been so important to stress this as fund funding comes in the executive budget. Um, it becomes impossible at, you know, in the end of June to ramp up programs um, of this complexity given that you need to do you know, screening of the staff, um, enrolling kids, and you know, working with DOE to uh, secure sites is not always the easiest thing. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little also about after school programs for elementary school students. Uh, there's a significant portion of the Compass system uh, that is supported by the city council and has been now, uh, some of them for five years and some for three years where the city council uh, did some expansion. These are programs that either were um, uh, long-standing programs that didn't uh, get contracts when, when Compass funding was baseline, or programs that were part of the intentional expansion and part of the city council to find more um, service in high need areas. So we very much want to see the council restore those funding, the, those funds. Um, with the Summer Youth Employment Program, um, as you may know, in, in May 2016, UNH and Campaign for Summer Jobs released a white paper showing how um, summer jobs should expand. Um, and this influenced a lot of the process around the uh, Youth Employment Task Force and then what became the concept paper for uh, the YCD summer jobs, the first part of which the school-based model has already been awarded. Um, our biggest concern looking forward is um, the rates in the SYP program. Um, the concept paper gave a range of $325 to $1,000 per youth. Uh, this range actually reflects the current cost of the different models uh, from YY, from younger youth to the Ladders for Leader model. And we know now only the rates for the school-based model, which are about 800 per youth. Um, the concept paper really envisions a much more intensive level of service where providers are doing more counseling, doing more to connect. Uh, young people to jobs that meet their interests. 
And so we expect to see and need to see higher rates for those programs in order to have the staff to support these things. Uh, one other quick thing, um, I just wanted to give our strong support for the Work, Learn, and Grow program for both baselining and expanding that model. Um, and really talk about how, as uh, Brian Licata mentioned, this is a program that really supports SYP because um, it supports SYP from a programmatic perspective because it um, can has the you know the young person working year round, and we'd actually like to see the model move to somewhere where they could potentially be at the same employer year round. Um, but it also actually really supports the providers because this is a school year program. It means that you have staff there who are working year round and can help prepare for SYP when summer comes and you have a much larger number of youth you serve. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And our next panel. Oh, sorry, one more. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. You're fine. <laughs> it's all right. Um, good afternoon, my name is Jamie Polovich and I am the executive director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth, otherwise known as CHY. CHY has advocated for the needs of runaway and homeless youth for nearly 40 years. The coalition is comprised of 60 providers of services to homeless youth across New York State. 29 of our members are here in New York City. Our members include providers that are directly contracted to provide services to runaway and homeless youth, as well as agencies that intersect with the runaway and homeless youth population within the larger scope of their work. I'd like to thank Chair Rose and the members of the Youth Services Committee for holding today's hearing. I would also like to thank Speaker Johnson and the Council for their leadership in making long overdue changes to the DYCD homeless youth system with the passage of the three runaway homeless youth bills a couple weeks ago. It is unfortunate that in a city as progressive as New York City, we had to pass laws to force the administration to do something that they could have done voluntarily. But we are extremely grateful for the dedication of the City Council to do the right thing on behalf of the countless homeless young people and providers who have been pushing for these changes for several years. Um, in regards to runaway and homeless youth funding, I go into a little bit more detail in my testimony, but for the sake of time, I'll just summarize here. Um, we do uh, have an additional ask to support runaway and homeless youth, and as it's been echoed by two of our members already, our ask is an additional $10.2 million. That would um, create 100 additional DYCD runaway and homeless youth beds for the new older youth category of 21 to 25. Uh, to 25 year olds. It would increase the DYCD 24 hour drop in center capacity by providing funding for two additional centers to be hopefully located in the Bronx and Brooklyn, meaning that all boroughs, with the exception of Staten Island, would have their own. Number three, to add 15 housing specialists. Right now, unlike DHS or ACS, DYCD does not currently fund a speci specialized position within their programs to help young people obtain permanent long-term housing. And if you look at DYCD's data about how they're doing in meeting that goal, um, the numbers are pretty low. And last, we are also asking for an additional 7% general contract increase to help providers um, meet the real needs and the real cost to run the programs. I also would like to thank you for asking DYCD about the MMR and the way that they do calculate their outcomes. Um, we do find it extremely problematic that they are including all discharge options with the exception of unknown or self-discharge in the outcome of suitable environment. And not only does it include young people that are being incarcerated, it also includes those that are being hospitalized and those that are being discharged to other, um, not family or friend, which as a provider myself, that was the option you, check, you checked when young people are returning to their traffickers or pimps. Um, we are working with um, the administration around the, these outcomes, and we hope uh, to have it changed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, for that depressing note. <laughs> we, we're going to work on that. We're going to work on other suitable um, placements. That's not acceptable. Mateo Guerrero Tavares. Make the Road and TGNC Solutions Coalition. 
Um, Andrea Bowen, Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition. Susan LaCert, uh, uh, Queens Botanical Gardens and Cultural World. And Richard Holloman. Um, you know who I'm talking about, right? <laughs> who, who, how I can't read it. Queens Historical Society. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then we have one more panel after this. Thank you, very patient people. Please um, uh, turn your mic on, say your name, state your name and your organization, and begin your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Rose, um, Councilmember Chin, and Council staff. Uh, my name is Andrea Bowen, and I am a consultant working with uh, the Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition. Um, uh, the coalition is made up of several organizations, including Anti-Violence Project, the Audrey Lord Project, uh, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, the LGBT Center, uh, the Trans Latina Network, and GMHC. Um, they formed um, on the impetus of the LGBT Caucus of City Council and the previous speaker um, to figure out what solutions were needed from TGNC people throughout the city. Um, they, we held uh, forums in all five boroughs, including Staten Island, to figure out what the community needed. And since then, we've been boiling those down to, we have six budget asks this budget season. We also have a longer policy brief that we've put online. Um, Mateo is going to uh, speak in a moment about um, programs around legal support for undocumented immigrants. I'm gonna speak on a proposal um, about um, a, a TGNC employment program. We have been pitching these to the mayor's staff um, and agencies, um, and in the event that they don't end up in the executive budget, we'd love your support in trying to get them in. <laughs> so, um, so um, the TGNC community uh, faces a crisis of unemployment, um, especially when you compare um, uh, the TGNC community against um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people who aren't TGNC, you have even more disparate stats. Um, just for example, um, let's see. Um, you have 16.2% uh, of TGNC New York City uh, respondents to a survey a couple of years were neither unemployed nor in school compared to 9.9% of lesbian, gay, bisexual respondents. We also know that TGNC people face um, problems in completing job training programs. Um, and TGNC people, face special needs in uh, getting jobs. So like when you're applying, what if your legal name doesn't match the name that you usually go by? Um, what if you've transitioned since you had an old job? What do you tell your old employer? Do you end up outing yourself when you're filing for a background check? Things like that. So we're asking for a program. Um, we'd like part of it to be housed in DYCD and then an adult part to be housed in HRA. So youth portion for DYCD, adult for HRA. Um, that would support TGNC people in aiming for careers. It would be basically money for like a staff that would help people navigate the employment system and place people in appropriate job programs, um, money for subsidized wages, um, and a little bit of money for evaluation and advertising. Um, you were asking for the mayor's side, so we'd like to see this baselined over several years. But again, if this doesn't end up with executive, we'd love your support in pushing this. So thank you for your time. Hello. I'm Susan Lassert from Queens Botanical Garden, and I love your name, Rose. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> you certainly, well, I'll make sure you get your funding. Yeah, right. thank you, thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome out for a tour anytime. <laughs> um, I'm from Queens Botanical Garden, which is one of the 33 um, institutions that are in the Cultural Institutions Group. This is my colleague, Richard, who's in what they call the Programs Group. He will speak in a moment, but we, um, work with many, many different partners around the whole city to provide all sorts of programming and support for community services. And um, last year, the Cultural Committee um, did a big plan with the commissioner and came out with a, a big um, Create NYC program, which is about equity, social um, and economic impact, inclusion, um, lifestyles. 
and I would like to say that the cultural community has really proven that we can help with citywide initiatives and needs. Like you think of IDNYC and how successful that was, it's because, partly because they came to us and said, would you help, and we offered all sorts of admissions and benefits to people, and they said, let's sign up. Also in composting and dealing with organic citywide, we do a lot of education. And so I think listening to um, the testimony here today, that it's, this is also an area that we could help with. And in fact, we already do, because so many of our organizations already um, participate in summer youth employment program, the um, Ladders for Leaders, the Sonic, the Compass, all of these words and phrases, some of which I understand and some of which I don't. But um, we, we do that. And so at the Queens Botanical Garden, we have in the summer, we have about 35 youth that come. And we, what we do is we raise private money to help make that a successful program. Because you know youth are wonderful, but they've never had a job. They don't know they're not supposed to talk on their cell phone, that they have to sign in and sign out. So we, um, we hire people to help with that. We have about eight, um, eight pr people per one counselor. And we raise about $35,000, $40,000 a year just to do that. So there's a way. The cultures are looking for um, the $10 million that was in the budget last year to be baselined in this year. We're also looking for another $20 million citywide, of course, to help carry out some of the initiatives that were in the um, Create NYC. And I think given all of our combined interest in youth and in healthy communities and providing opportunities for young people to grow in their lives, to get into the workforce. And I will say, we find a lot of the youth, they come, they haven't had breakfast. They don't have money for transportation. So, you know, if DYCD were able to give funding, like let's say $1,000 per youth, something on that order, it would help provide the uh, supervision that's needed and also metro cards and food. Right now our Tai Chi group brings in pork buns, the Hindu temple sends us samosas, the Mexican guy down the street sends empanadas, the pizza guy, so you know, we, we could do more if we had more. Thank you. Thank you. Go. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sure. Did I butt in? I, I would sorry. assume also that you spoke before the um, libraries and cultural uh, committee? Our, some people from our group did, yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Hi, yeah, so um, I'm here also with Andy. Um, my name is Mateo Guerrero. I'm part of Make Through New York. I'm Leadership Development Coordinator, and we're also part of the TGNC Solutions Coalition. Um, so I am here today to testify about the urgency of having immigration lawyers that are competent uh, to support TGNC communities, transgender and non-conforming folks in particular. So just a little bit of, of so what I wanted to share is my experience, right? So I migrated from Colombia in 2010 with both of my parents. Um, and when we migrated, it was very challenging because we were undocumented. Uh, not only was that a challenge in terms of like me being able to uh, go to school and continue to work uh, to be able to s support my family, this was at 15 years old, uh, but also because at that time, uh, my gender was different. I, I, I presented as a woman before. And so when I shared with my father my sexuality as a lesbian, uh, we spent about two months with like heavy arguments and he left to Colombia and we ended communication. Um, and so during that, after he left, it was extremely difficult for my mother and I to sustain ourselves. So like housing and stability, food, everything was very challenging. But uh, one of the things that was there was that my mom was always supportive and uh, she always encouraged me to like participate in different youth programs, and that's when I went to Make Through New York. At Make Through New York, I started doing organizing. It was an, an amazing. Uh, I remember the first time I went there, they were chanting "Undocumented, Unafraid," and it was the first time I said it out loud. A little bit, uh, I was a little bit scared because you know it was the first time. But um, I stayed there, and in 2012, when Obama announced DACA, I thought I was going to be able to qualify for DACA. Um, but because I came in 2010, I wasn't able to qualify because the requirements that you enter before 2007. So that immediately was very hard for me to hear. But the lawyers, uh, the immigration lawyers on Make the Road actually did a screening for me. And they asked me several questions and 
uh, they were able to find out that I qualify for SISH, right? As a queer, transgender young person, I was able to qualify for SISH. And SISH stands for a Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, uh, which is for folks who are under 18 and have a guardian or a parent or under 21 and have a guardian or, ha or are in the foster care system to be able to uh, obtain an immigration relief status. So I was able to qualify for that because immigration lawyers and Make the Road had the training to make the connections between TGNC communities and the access to different immigration reliefs. Um, and so this is a testimony, a, success, a testimony of success of being able to <coughs> outreach to TGNC youth uh, to be able to adjust their status. So one of the, two of the recommendations that came from the coalition is one, to provide trainings to immigration lawyers to be culturally a sensitive, competent, to, uh, to support TGNC folks and also to hire more immigration lawyers um, in different organizations that already do this work. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, and in the back is uh, the platform, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Richard Horhan. I'm the curator and collections manager at the Queens Historical Society. And I've been personally involved in the summer youth employment program at the Queens Historical Society and have worked with uh, 35 participants over the past three summers. Uh, briefly put, my organization has benefited greatly from the contributions of these youths. They have been extremely conscientious and they have absorbed and expanded on everything our programs have offered. One does not immediately associate historical uh, societies with youth programs, summer or after school. This, unfortunately, I believe, is the result of a stereotypical understanding or misunderstanding of what history is, an unending list of names and dates. That may have been true of classroom teaching 75 years ago. It never was true of the serious study of history. But contemporary history studies all peoples, events, and structures of communities and societies. This is certainly the case with my organization and in our youth programs. We stress the continuities and discontinuities of history in Queens, our nation, and the world. Over 48% of Queens residents are foreign born. Another 25% are children of parents who are foreign born. 75% of the participants in our youth programs belong to these two categories. While the Queens Historical Society does not have any contracts for Compass or schools out in New York City, we would love some. They are very important and should be expanded. There is such an unmet need for them. I am familiar with the number of their programs in Queens and they are extremely effective. In spite of not receiving funding from NYC for youth programs, we provide them under two rubrics, Immigrant Voices and Leading the Way, Outstanding Women of Queens. Cultural organizations can open new perspectives to youth. We are all cultural in the art sense of the word and cultural, lowercase, in the anthropological sense of the word. The cultural organizations, at least in Queens, bring these hu two human dimensions together in their programs, and the Queens Historical Society takes these two and adds a third dimension, history. Thank you for allotting me this time to speak. Thank you, thank, thank you all. Thank you. And the last panel, Ingrid Vintil from Link and City's First Readers, Deanna Mirth, Jumpstart, City's First Readers, Harriet Liesel, City's First Readers, and Caitlin Canfield, City's First Readers, VIP, and Kristen Aldrich, New York Public Library for City's First Readers. There seems to be a trend here. Lori Williams, Reach Out and Read of Greater New York and City's First Readers. Okay, so 
Um, you could all just talk at the same time. As <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, please uh, identify, state your name and your organization. I think we know which one that is. Okay. And uh, you can begin your testimony. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair Rose and uh, Commission, um, Madam um, Chin. I'm so sorry, I'm a little fuzzy now. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak on behalf of Cities First Readers. Cities First Readers is an early literacy initiative um, with, and it is a collaboration between 11 nonprofit organizations. We are all represented here today. And what we do is we foster literacy development of the young children of New York City from ages birth through five. The initiative provides families, early child care providers, and teachers with resources and services needed to ensure that children enter school ready to read and achieve educational success. Why Cities First Readers is necessary, <clears throat> this initiative brings families, children, infants, toddlers, caregivers together to understand the importance to understand the importance of literacy. Did you know that families um, where parents identify as professional, children entering school have ex experience being read to 1,000 to 17, 1,700 hours of read aloud time. Compared to the children living in poverty, that number is only 25 hours a year. Um, disproportionately, this affects children of color in New York City, and right now, two out of three children living in poverty do not read on grade level when they're tested in the third grade. A student living in poverty who can't read on grade level by third grade will not be able to keep up and is 13 times lessly, less likely to graduate from high school. With City Council's support, Cities First Readers will continue to offer its effective community-based programs and to help the parents and young children of New York City be prepared to enter school ready to read. Cities First Readers is making this a reality. Uh, in FY17 program year, the 11 partners, actually there were 10 partners, served approximately 800,000 families and children in New York City with research proven programs and services offered by the partners across New York City. Uh, we are asking for your renewed and enhanced support and we are re respectfully requesting a budget enhancement of $6 million. Council funding at this level will allow City's First Readers to expand program outcomes and to reach more families citywide, to build a citywide public awareness campaign to connect families and caregivers directly to programs and services and support school readiness, to provide families and caregivers with developmentally appropriate books, and to strengthen the infrastructure and data evaluation. The science is clear, a robust investment in early childhood literacy programming can help break the cycles of poverty, and we ask that you continue for your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. I think I need your yes. mic. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Dina Murtha, and I am representing Jumpstart for Young Children, known as Jumpstart in our work as part of City's First Readers Initiative. Uh, Jumpstart is an early childhood education organization with the mission of providing language, literacy, and social-emotional programming for preschool children from under-resourced communities and promoting quality early learning for all. We are fueled by one core belief, that providing equal education opportunities to young children contributes to breaking the cycle of poverty. Our program model places highly trained and qualified college students in preschool classrooms to provide a curriculum targeted at improving literacy, language, and social emotional development outcomes, all while working towards our vision of every child entering kindergarten prepared to succeed. Jumpstart is thrilled to be part of the city's first readers initiative and contributes to the initiative's efforts to provide resources and services to help children enter school ready to read and achieve educational success. We provide direct service to preschool children in their classrooms and regularly coordinate and host family and community outreach events, introducing families to our programming and providing participants with literacy building activities that they can then do at home. 
Uh, this year we've hosted more than 50 events, including many events, with the partners from this initiative, and we have several more planned for the rest of the year. Our program in preschool classrooms is serving over 1,500 children and engages 600 college students from 10 New York City colleges and universities. And these college students deliver our curriculum in 80 preschool classrooms throughout Manhattan, Queens, the Bronx, and Brooklyn. During the school year, teams of six to eight college students engage preschool children in group reading, activities, and lessons that contribute to the development of skills critical to being prepared for success in kindergarten. And during the summer, we run a summer program to help combat summer slide. And we started an extended day program this year in the Bronx. So Jumpstart and the members of the city's first initiative are working to ensure that each child in New York City has their best childhood possible. We believe that all children deserve to have the education and opportunity to set them on the path for success, from experiencing supportive environment in low child to adult ratios, to large-scale community events promoting effective reading tips to families and caregivers. Jumpstart and City's First Readers Initiative partners are building a continuum of services that reach all aspects of a child's life to build a strong foundation in early literacy skills. Support for the initiative helps to ensure that this valuable work will continue. Additional funding will allow Jumpstart and the initiative to continue offering our impactful programming throughout the city as well as provide even more robust community events. Thanks a lot for your support of Jumpstart and the City's First Readers Initiative and for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, good, af uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Harriet LaSalle and I'm the Director of Government Contracts and Advocacy at JCCA. I want to thank the committee chair, Council Member Rose, and the, the committee uh, members for staying <laughs> and for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Uh, JCCA is most appreciative of the Council's interest in early literacy and funding of the city's first readers. So I'm here in support of the city first readers initiative and the request for six million dollars in funding for 2019. Um, JCCA is fortunate to be uh, one of the newest uh, organizations um, in the city's first readers program and we're the first foster care agency to participate in the initiative. Um, we've been able to serve the youngest children in foster care in our Brooklyn and Bronx offices. Foster youth are at even greater disadvantage because they experience trauma, frequently changed homes, and changed school child care. Um, as part of City's First Readers, JCC has created literacy-rich spaces, and there's a picture on the third page in color that I'd like you to see. Um, Utilize it, that we utilize during visits with birth and foster parents. Children have access to books, and over 360 have been distributed thus far to children in foster care. Um, we have uh, literacy-themed events, um, you know, that connect parents and children. Um, uh, and, and we have our caseworkers identify literacy challenges to connect children and parents with the services of our literacy center. So um, I'm just going to briefly talk about a family who came into care in JCCA. Um, both children were placed out of the home, a four-year-old and a five-month-old. And when the birth parent would come, she would really struggle with trying to provide equal attention to both of her daughters. Um, and often the four-year-old would end up being placed in timeout so she could, you know, spend time with the baby. Um, and that workers were having a difficult time providing feedback and suggestions. So they moved their visits to the Early Literacy Center and have really found that the parent has been able to engage in her children in a way that was not possible before. The baby can crawl around and, and uh, engage with age-appropriate toys. The older child now has access to books and puzzles, which she's able to use to show her mom how much she has learned um, in her new daycare. Um, the parent has become calmer and has helped her better to appropriately sort of redirect her children and manage their needs. You know, this parent had been resistant to feedback in the past, but in the Literacy Center, staff are really starting to work with her, like they're using literacy as a way to get to some of the parenting issues that they need to address with her. So the kids are enjoying themselves. Um, she noticed the labeling because we have, you know, words labeled in English and Spanish throughout the center, um, and it's really started to help her really do things in a different way. Um, and so, um, 
This initiative has enhanced JCCA's work with the youngest children in foster care to improve age-appropriate literacy, but also sounds as a that serves as a foundation for lifelong learning, but also serves as an entry point to engage parents and children in their interaction and communications that will affect family reunification. We're much appreciative, and um, we look forward to continued funding for the initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Caitlin Camfield from uh, New York uh, NYU Langone Health and the Video Interaction Project, or VIP. Uh, so VIP uses pediatric health care to enhance children's early development and school readiness. Pediatric checkups are a unique way to reach low-income families because all parents need to bring their children to the doctor, and very frequently, as anyone with young children knows. Um, and so that allows programs like VIP and Reach on Read, which you'll hear about, uh, to achieve great impacts with uh, very low cost. Um, and so in VIP, during their pediatric checkups, families meet with a VIP parent coach who provides them with a book or a toy that they get to take home. Uh, they're videotaped uh, reading or playing together with their child for a few minutes. And then the parent coach reviews the video with them to point out and support all of the parents' strengths and the positive things that they're doing in the interaction. Uh, through Cities First Readers, these parents are also connected to other literacy programs in their communities. Uh, for instance, we've been able to sign families up for library cards right in the pediatric clinic. Uh, VIP also empowers parents to be their child's first teachers. Uh, and rigorous studies have shown that children in VIP have improvements in language, in problem solving, and in behavior that uh, last into the early school years and really help them succeed in school. Uh, our team of researchers at NYU Langone is also currently uh, leading a scientific study of Cities First Readers. Uh, we found that using healthcare to promote literacy through this initiative has been associated with increased use of the library among parents, and together they uh, both of those have been associated with parents reading more with their children at home. Um, and this is even before babies are six months old. Um, these findings demonstrate the potential for large impacts across New York City if Cities First Readers is expanded. Uh, and this research is also part of the National Bridging the Word Gap Research Network, and it was featured at the National Meeting of the Pediatric Academic Societies, which has made Cities First Readers and New York a model for cities around the country who are prioritizing investment in young children. Um, and in fact, we've had several colleagues approach us asking us more about the, the initiative and how they can replicate it in their cities. Uh, the program has also been endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics because of its potential to enhance the health of children, of parents, and of families. Um, and it's vital that Cities First Readers really continues to grow. Increased funding next year will allow us to reach more children and families, increasing impacts for our youngest New Yorkers. So uh, I want to thank the council for uh, your support of this initiative and for the opportunity to speak today. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kristen Rich Aldrich. I'm the manager of early childhood education at the New York Public Library. Um, and I am here today representing uh, all three library systems in New York City. Um, and we are truly grateful for City Council's generous support of City's First Readers and the continual increase in funding. Uh, each year, New York Public Library, Brooklyn Public Library, and Queens Library offer neighborhood early literacy programs with an annual attendance over half a million. As part of the city's first readers, each library system is developing and expanding its own early literacy services. Here are a few highlights. New York Public Library has distributed over 105,000 early literacy outreach kits uh, to encourage families to read at home. Um, and that includes a board book and a growth chart and a resource list for families. Um, and we've also expanded our family literacy workshops for to 87 of our library branches. Queens Public Library was ex uh, expanded their play spaces into three new branches this past year. Um, they were also able to hire one more early literacy specialist to assist families in their communities and to engage with literacy rich materials. Brooklyn Public Library is offering a credit bearing early childhood educator series on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and connecting teachers with vital early literacy resources to enrich their classrooms. Here, with everyone sitting at this table, um, are a few examples of how this initiative has allowed us to collaborate with our other program partners who we are extremely grateful to have. Um, Parent Child Home Program, who you heard from earlier today, has worked with Queens Library to provide their families a closer interaction with the library's pre-K program in Ravenswood. 
Um, they've co-hosted programs at their school to introduce families to all that the library can offer them. Uh, Jumpstart, um, who you also just heard from, partnered with Bookham Public Library to offer programs at the New Lots Library to promote home learning and school readiness. Um, and Reach Out and Read, who you will hear from in a minute. Um, they are medical, work with our medical, pro or not our medical providers, work with the library medical providers um, prescribing reading and going to the library. Um, with a $6 million in support of City's First Readers, um, this vitally important work will only grow uh, in New York City's libraries. We could support and train family child care providers, expand specialized family learning opportunities, grow school readiness activities, distribute more early literacy outreach kits, and provide more baby and toddler literacy development programs in locations across the city. In the spirit of the three systems working together, along with City's First Readers, to support uh, this important initiative, we need the mayor and city council to keep investing in libraries so we can continue to provide the programs and service, services all New Yorkers deserve. That means continuing to fund six-day service at all locations and the care and keeping of our branches system-wide, which have critical maintenance and technology infrastructure needs. The library is the first social interaction many new families have, and we want it to be the most enriching experience possible, regardless of background, demographic, or means. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Lori Williams, and I'm representing Reach Out and Read of Greater New York, where I serve as the executive director. I want to take first the opportunity to thank Chair Rose, Council Member Chin, and the City Council for your commitment uh, to ensure that every child in New York City will begin school with the literacy skills that enable him or her to succeed. It, it means a lot to everyone on this panel and to New York City, so thank you. As part of the City's First Readers Initiative and partnership, this ongoing city support has been invaluable, but there's still much work to be done. Consider that by age three, children from high-income families are exposed to 30 million more words than children from low-income communities. This disparity is reflective of unacceptable inequalities. It's inequalities of access to resources, that have profound implications for our children in school and beyond. For the past two decades, Reach Out and Read has been working to ensure that children all across New York have the resources to develop a strong foundation for lifelong success. Our program takes advantage of the unique access to pediatric primary care and those providers that they have to children who are in their critical years of cognitive and language development. We provide doctors and medical staff with training and resources to help them become a child's first reading role model. Medical providers that we work with read with children as part of routine well-child visits and help parents and other family members understand the critical importance of reading aloud to their children regularly. And because so many of the families we work with just don't have access to resources to buy books, children are given books to take home that are both developmentally and culturally appropriate. The book is the springboard to action, a seed of literature that will germinate as families encouraged and informed by our physicians make reading a part of everyday life. Without this critical first step, before children even enter school, the obstacles that our city's children face can be insurmountable. Annually, Reach Out and Read serves about 275,000 children and families at 167 hospitals and clinics across New York. Funding from the City Council has helped us provide early literacy services in 43 of the 51 City Council districts. Despite impressive efforts made possible by City's First Readers, we still feel there's so much more to be done. And the fact that we have the synergy of this partnership and what we've done in terms of providing in many ways a continuum of services where we partner with each one of the folks here, we just feel like it's created something very special and there's been research that's sort of beginning to show the efficacy of this incredible partnership. We hope that you will consider the $6 million support for this year because we feel like there's still so much more to do and we are incredibly grateful for your compassion and interest and care. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I wanna thank all of you for what you do because reading is not only fundamental but I think it's foundational. And so 
um, for what you do on getting our young people a, a, a good start, a good foundation. I want to thank you. And I, I want to thank the administration for staying and, um, and hearing all of the important testimony. And I want to thank all of you who came and um, participated today. It's, it's important that um, your voice is heard. I do truly believe that the squeaky wheel gets oil. And um, I'm, I'm glad that you came to uh, share with us your budget concerns for the youth committee. And, um, and I want to thank you for what you all, all of you are doing for youth development, uh, because you truly are preparing you know, our future. So I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank my colleague, Margaret Chin, for hanging in to the bitter end. And um, of course, the wonderful staff that we have here, um, Jessica Ackerman and Paul Senegal. Um, I want to thank you all. And this meeting is adjourned at 10 to 6. Thank you so much. <laughs>